I'll see if I can get the right committee today. I kept calling IF and WACF yesterday, so until it was pointed out to me. So my name's Cheryl, not Linda. Yeah, true. <laughs> and it's Karen, not John. Yeah. <laughs> We all set? I am all set. Are you are all set? Yeah, we are ready to go. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Senator Jim Dill, and I'm the chair of the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Committee. And we first have a confirmation followed by several work sessions today. So we will get right going. Uh, as I say, it's going to be a busy day. So I will start with introductions, and I'll start with Representative Bernard. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sue Bernard. I represent District 149, uh, which is in Caribou, Westmanland, and New Sweden, located in Arista County, the Crown of Maine. Good morning. Good morning. Representative Osher. Good morning. I'm Laurie Osher. I represent District 123. That's most of Orno, the home of the University of Maine. Representative McCray. Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Representative David McCray. I live in Fort Fairfield up in the center of Aroostook County, uh, and I live in Fort Fairfield, the home of the Maine Potato Blossom Festival. Good morning. Representative Hall. Good morning, Randy Hall, uh, District 114, representing six towns in Southern Franklin County. Representative O'Neill. Good morning, uh, my name is Maggie O'Neill, and I'm here representing House District 15, which is in Saco. Senator Black. Good morning, Senator Black representing Senate District 17, which is all of Franklin County and four towns in Kennebec. Representative Underwood. Good morning, I'm Joseph Underwood. I am representative from District 147 in Presque Isle. And it's great to see everybody this morning. Good morning. Representative Schofield. Good morning, Senator Dill and everyone. My name is Tom Schofield. I represent House District 112. I live in the town of Weld, but this morning I am I am uh, streaming live from beautiful Sebago Lake State Park in Casco and Naples, Maine. It's a wonderful day down there. Good morning. Good morning. Representative Landry. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Senator Dill. I'm Scott Landry. I represent the towns of Farmington and New Sharon in Franklin County, District 113. I think that's everyone. You guys have been switching around here on me this morning, so I think I got everybody. Um, our clerk is Cheryl McGowan, and our analyst is Karen Netto. And just to remind everybody, that the first thing we have is a confirmation hearing but it's no disrespect to anybody or when we get into the work sessions, but we've all got several committees that we may be either testifying in and have work sessions in, or may just actually have competing committees. Um, so people will be in and out. So um, without any further ado, I will start with our first confirmation or our first conf the confirmation hearing of the day. And so I'll open up the confirmation hearing for Everett Worcester of Ornville Township for appointment to the Maine Land Use Planning Commission. I do have a script that I read, so I will go through that and uh, we'll go from there. This is a public hearing of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry for the purpose of consider the nomination by the governor, Mr. Everett Worcester of Ornville Township for appointment to the Maine Land Use Planning Commission. Under the law and joint rules of the legislature, this committee is required to hold this public hearing and to recommend a confirmation and denial of nominee by majority vote of the committee members present and voting. As chairs of the committee, we will then send written notice of the committee's recommendation to the president of the Senate. The committee will hear testimony from and have an opportunity to question the governor or her representative, the nominee, and any other persons present who wish to speak for or against the nomination. This meeting is currently being live streamed on the committee's YouTube channel. This means that anyone who is participant in the meeting via Zoom can be seen and also heard if their microphone is unmuted. People testifying cannot be seen or heard until they are called upon to speak. This meeting will be recorded and available to view on the committee's YouTube channel soon after the meeting has concluded. Motion to confirm. Pursuant to Title III, Section 157 of the main statutes, which requires it to be an affirmative motion to recommend confirmation of the nominee. The chair recognizes my co-chair, Representative O'Neill, for making 
the nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I make that motion. Okay. Um, the motion has been made. Um, for Everett Worcester of Owenville Township for the appointment to Maine Land Use Planning Commission. Um, the copy of the requirements for, the, for this uh, position is available. And first I will go ahead and I will now represent, uh, I will recognize the governor's representative for the purpose of making a statement concerning this nomination. And uh, who do we have? Do we have anybody from the governor's office? Yes, we have uh, Michael Williams. Michael Williams. Oh, I see him over here in the corner. Sorry. Good morning, Mr. Williams. Good morning, Good morning Senator Dill. How are you today? Good. Yourself? Not too bad. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Senator Dill and Representative O'Neill for uh, and the members of the committee for allowing me to speak. Uh, as said, I am Mike Williams. I'm the county manager here in Piscataquis County. I appeared before you today on behalf of the county commissioners here in Piscataquis to introduce Mr. Everett Worcester for appointment to the LUPC. The commissioners uh, voted unanimously on April 20th to uh, appoint Mr. Worcester, and he uh, graciously agreed enthusiastically to uh, represent the Scatequists, uh, and that was a 3-0 vote. Uh, Mr. Worcester is currently coming off a four-year term, and he meets all the statutory requirements. So on behalf of the commissioners and the governor, I enthusiastically uh, request the committee to uh, approve uh, Mr. Worcester. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Williams? All right, seeing none. Again, thank you for your testimony and presenting this morning. Um, I now recognize Mr. Everett Worcester for making a statement. Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. As you know, my name is Everett Worcester. My wife and I, live on our blueberry farm in Onville Township, and we have for the past 30 years. Uh, Onville Township is located between Milo and Bradford, approximately 35 miles north of Bangor. I included a brief resume with my paperwork to highlight. After high school at Columbia Falls, I graduated from Washington State, State Teachers College with a BS degree. I started my teaching career in Lincoln as a math science junior high teacher. I spent 17 years in education, teaching from the fourth grade level through graduate level courses. Along the way, I received a master's in education degree from Arno and a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin in educational administration. My wife also received a PhD degree from Texas in gifted and talented education and learning disabilities. We were both working in Louisiana when my wife was offered a position as assistant professor at UMO teaching in her specialty fields. We moved, moved back to Maine and I spent a year or so upgrading a hunting camp into a year round facility and taking care of our newly born daughter. Our insurance agent also had a small real estate business and one thing led to another and I became a sales agent working under him. I discovered I really liked the real estate business and I went and got my broker's license, opened my own agency and in 2019, I retired after 30 years as a real estate broker and appraiser. These days, my wife and I are focused on our blueberry business. We have a fairly extensive fresh pack and value added operation, as well as frozen berries for sale year round. We were sort of back to the earth as when we moved back to Maine, and I guess we never lost it. I am completing my eighth year on the Land Use Planning Commission. I would be happy to attempt to answer any questions you might have of me. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Worcester? All right, seeing none, 
is uh, what I'll do now is I'll turn to see if there's anyone else. Cheryl, do we have anyone else that's going to speak? Not that I know of. All right, if there's no one else to uh, speak uh, on this nomination, um, let's see, I will jump down to, all public comments haven't been taken. The committee will now proceed as follows. If you any other written comments, um, vote on the nomination and notify the president of the Senate. The vote must be taken within uh, 35 days from the notice. And I will close the hearing now for Mr. Everett Worcester of Onville Township for appointment to the Maine Land Use Planning Commission. Next, we'll take the vote in accordance with the law. The committee may not take the vote on this nomination sooner than 15 minutes. Does everybody agree we can take it now? Anyone opposed? Nope, okay. Um, the pending question before the committee is that the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry recommend to the Senate of the 130th Maine Legislature that the nomination of Mr. Everett Worcester of Onville Plant Champ Township for appointment to the Maine Land Use Planning Commission be confirmed. So with that, would you please call the roll? I will. Uh, nominee Everett Worcester to be approved. Representative Susan Bernard. Yes. Representative Susan Bernard. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Representative Margaret O'Neill, yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black, yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Bill Fluker, absent. Representative Jeffrey Gifford. Yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, yes. Representative David McRae, absent. 11 yes and two absent. So with 11 members voting in the affirmative and none in the negative, it is the voting of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry that the nomination of Mr. Everett Worcester of Onville Township for appointment to the Maine Land Use Planning Commission be confirmed. Congratulations, Mr. Worcester. Thank you. All right, with that, this will conclude the, our confirmation hearing and we will move on into our regularly scheduled program for today, our work sessions. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have nine work sessions today, but um, the last two, 471 and act to require legislative approval for certain leases of public lands and 1075 and act to protect public lands. If there's anybody waiting for those, we are moving those till Thursday because we're waiting on some more information um, for the work session. So we're not gonna do those two work sessions today. Again, that's LD 471 and 1075. Those will be moved to the end of the day. I mean, to the Thursday from the end of the day. And with that, oops, she's here. Then uh, we'll go into our work sessions. And the first one we have is LD 264, an act to prohibit aerial application of uh, PFAS and PFAS compounds, substances. And uh, Karen, would you take us through that, please? Uh, sure, uh, you tabled it, so it needs to be taken off the table. Can I have a motion to take this off the table? Only uh, Representative O'Neill, seconded by Representative Landry. All in favor, just raise your hand, please, and it is off the table. With that, now you can go ahead. Karen, thank you. Thank you, Senator Dill. So um, 
The original bill, uh, section three prohibits the aerial application of a pesticide unless the board of pesticides control has determined that the pesticide has been analyzed by a third party entity not associated with the manufacturer of the pesticide who has discerned who has determined that the perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances, also known as PFAS, are not part of the formulation of the pesticide. And then section four of the original bill prohibits the aerial application of a pesticide if PFAS substances are part of the formulation of the pesticide. So I think the way that we left it last uh, work session, um, uh, Representative Pluker had articulated a proposed amendment. And uh, so I was going to work with him on that and, uh, you, you know, put it on paper for the next work session. But uh, I think additional changes have been made and uh, Representative Pluker has been working with the department on this. So um, I guess I'll toss it to Representative Pluker um, to, to talk about those discussions, I guess. I, um, I haven't, I don't know where the chips have fallen. You know, and I'm, I'm just now opening an email from the department on, on this. Um, um, let's see, is anybody from the department? Do you wanna, did you draft anything? Uh, no, I mean, I last okay. that I saw was uh, you sort of I could go through the bulleted list that you sent me. I, I'll, yeah, or I can go through that now. Or you can and, go through and, it. And, and then I assume there is somebody from the department who's who wants to talk about this. Is that true? Yeah, I just asked uh, Cheryl Gillett and Megan Patterson. Okay. Great. And I also see Nancy McBrady. I don't know if both Megan and Nancy have been working on it with me. So yeah. Okay. Let them both in, please. So the the four the four points are um, that we we drop this back to a resolve, um, and the reason for dropping it back to resolve right now may, mostly lies with the fact that the board of pesticide control does not have the power to um, do a lot of this regulation that we're looking for. Um, they've never regulated containers before. If anybody remembers from the public hearing, we learned that a lot of this PFAS is being introduced through uh, the, um, the fluorinated HDPE containers. Um, they also, we also learned in the public hearing, if you remember, is that there are fluorinated uh, surfactants and adjuvants that are um, part of some of these formulations and in some cases are being added to the form, you know, you mix it with your pesticide as you're going to apply it. Um, and so the BPC also doesn't have much or doesn't have any power to regulate uh, surfactants or adjuvants, which could also be sources of this PFAS. So we we're stepping back and going into, um, and look, basically going to step back to resolve to have the Board of Pesticide Control begin getting some information from the manufacturers of the, um, of the, of the, uh, of the different pesticides. Um, and basically having them, and we do, we met with the AAG and they do have the power to ask for affidavits of the manufacturers um, as to what is in their, um, their formulation. And so um, basically going back and coming up with the idea of how extensive this problem may or may not be. Um, and so having the manufacturers let us know what is in the formulation, if there's PFAS in the formulation, also letting us know if the uh, formulation has ever been stored, distributed, or packaged in fluorinated HDPE containers. So we're not regulating them. We're just collecting the information at this point. Um, and then, uh, and then have the BPC start looking into the use of fluorinated surfactants um, that are being used or sold in the state of Maine. And then the other aspect of what gotten the way with a lot of this work was that there is, we have a definition right now, there's legislation working its way through the health and human services uh, committee, um, which would define what PFAS is and what PFAS adulteration in drinking water is. And we don't, but we don't have that definition for, um, for pesticides. So the other part of this resolve would be to have the board of pesticide control work on creating some sort of PFAS. We have statute around what adulterate, 
that something that pesticides can be adulterated and that it's against the law for them to be adulterated. But we need to know what what level will are they adulterated once there's PFAS in there. And we're and so coming, so they're gonna work on an, a definition of what a PFAS adulteration would look like. And then have the BPC work out what would be necessary in order to regulate fluorinated surfactants, because right now they only regulate pesticides, though they don't regulate any surfactants whatsoever. Um, and then make it clear um, what would, if we were coming, so then the end of this resolve would be reporting back, they would report back to us after they've done this work in 2022. And we would be able to report out a bill at that point. And so if we wanted to make it necessary, um, to uh, the, if, if we wanted to make it illegal to apply uh, PFAS in the form of in, that would be included in a pesticide um, in the state of Maine, then try to figure out what would be necessary um, for the BPC to be able to have that power and do that work. And so that's that's a rough outline of the resolve that I thought of. And I've just now opened an email from BPC, not from BPC, but from the department um, outlining some thoughts on that. So maybe they could come in and talk to us about that. And who do you want to talk about that, Bill? Uh, excuse me, a rep, uh, Representative Fluker. I don't know. This email is from Emily, and I don't know if... Oh, it says some thoughts from BPC. So probably Megan put these together. Um, Megan put them together. Okay. Director McBrady and Director Patterson, are you drawing straws? or? If you don't mind, I'll, I'll take a crack at just addressing the, the broader resolve. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nancy McBrady. I'm uh, the Bureau Director for the Bureau of Agriculture, Food and Rural Resources. And I wanted to thank Representative Pluker for giving that um, overview. We have been working with him very hard to, to crack this nut and try and find um, a path forward. And I, we really do think that this resolve that he has brought forward um, is the path forward. I know that Megan um, did have some questions and comments and suggestions relative to what um, Representative Pluker is mentioning, but I, I just wanted to set the table here and, and let you all know that there has been a lot of discussion and effort trying to refine this, with the point being that the, Bureau, the Board of Pesticide Control will be able to go back in the next number of months to really dig into these particular um, areas of investigation and, and craft, you know, next steps. So I, I just wanted to commend Representative Pluker for working with us. And I think that that really is the way for us to dig in and start tackling this, this very broad issue. Um, so for the particulars, I will definitely turn that over to Director Patterson, Patterson if she wanted to flag any of the things that she um, did for Representative Pluker. Morning. Good morning. Yeah. So Megan Patterson, I'm the director of the Board of Pesticides Control. And I, I do want to thank Bill for that, um, Representative Flicker, my apologies, for the nice explanation of, of um, um, what, what we discussed and ultimately what you, um, how you put your thoughts together. I think that's um, really helpful to have um, a little context. So I did provide some comments, um, just seeking clarification mostly, uh, and, and sort of trying to outline a little bit too around um, you know, just setting expectations, right? I mean, you know, as you correctly stated that adjuvants are just not something that we currently regulate. Um, so I'm not sure what that process is going to look like in terms of what we'll find, but I think, right, it's just that this is an unknown and we're going to have to sort of venture into the unknown, which we are not unfamiliar with. Um, and I think too, so uh, in some of our original discussions and certainly the original bill text, um, the focus had been on aerial application. And I, I wasn't sure if with um, items number one and two affidavits from manufacturers and affidavits from uh, regarding how a product is stored in its fluorination of its HDP container, and then an affidavit regarding PFAS and the pesticide formulation, if we were being asked to look just at aerial application still, or if it's the whole body of 13,000 currently registered pesticides in advance of 2022, um, just clarification on that I think would be helpful. Uh, let's see what else. And I guess that's more or less it. Um, and I assume I assume you want us to look at adjuvants um, as opposed to surfactants, surfactants being a subset of adjuvants. It's sort of like pesticides versus insecticides, pesticides, the umbrella term, insecticide would be a subset of, of pesticides um, focused on controlling or managing insects. Um, what else did I have here? I mean, I guess- it's I didn't know the difference between yeah. surfactants and adjuvants. So that's good to understand that. 
Yeah, there are a whole bunch. I mean, so you, well, without going belaboring it, but like anti-foaming agents, and there are a number of things that spreader stickers is what they're, some of them are called. It depends on what they, what function they perform, I guess, is how they're named. Um, let's see. I think that's it. I mean, I don't know if you had questions for me about my comments, I'd be happy to clarify. Or if that. there's any of these, I think they were just shared with me, if there's any of those comments that you want to make sure that the whole committee has heard or then go ahead and, and yeah. share that. Okay. Yeah. So I guess I'll just reiterate that um, when it comes to, to the bits about affidavits. So um, when it comes to affidavits or really anything in the registration process, um, so I, I sort of had to work through um, the logic behind what we can ask for and how we ask for it with regard to registration of pesticides. So we have the authority to ask for essentially um, any documentation that we need with regard to um, re verifying registration. So that's not too much of a problem asking for affidavits. Um, what I was encouraged to do, um, given that we would be asking potentially for affidavits at some point in time for all pesticide products with regard to PFAS or for any other purpose, um, was to put that in language and rule. Um, and so that that would be the best place for it, given that it's not just a one-off, it isn't simply, you know, for a subset of products or clarification about a specific product, that if we're going to make it policy that we always ask for this information, that like that requirement should go into rule. Um, so for both the uh, affidavits from the manufacturer regarding fluorination of containers and the affidavits from the manufacturer on whether or not the pesticide contains PFAS, that those both should be in rule. Um, and that, that guidance was given by the AG's office. Um, and then with regard to adjuvants, um, you know, as uh, Representative Pluker mentioned, we don't currently regulate adjuvants. Um, while adjuvants are sometimes a part of a formulation of a pesticide, they are also sold, and that was correctly stated, they are also sold separately. And um, <clears throat> EPA does have oversight of adjuvants, um, but they're not regulated to the same degree um, with regard to labeling, um, instructions provided on labeling as pesticides are. Um, so they're sort of, um, they're treated a, a bit differently in that sense. Um, they still do risk evaluations on them. There's still consideration of how um, those materials might be mixed, tank mixed with a pesticide and what kind of risk they might pose to both human health and the environment. Um, but they, they don't have the same um, degree of, of label language and instruction for use as a pesticide product typically does. Um, and so that said, um, our sole charge is pesticides. Um, so we, it might be a little tricky to determine exactly I mean, the question here is, I think, um, determine if any fluorinated mm -hmm. surfactants are being sold. And I think <clears throat> that piece, I think that's just a matter of, of trying to identify all the places where they might be sold. And part of the assumption would be, and it might be a leap of um, logic to assume that the same manufacturers or retailers that are selling pesticides are also selling surfactants. So we'll have to work through that. That's just, that's for us to deal with. Um, so I'm not sure how complete the ultimate reporting will be regarding total sales of surfactants, but you know, if, if we feel there are any um, maybe holes in our reporting, we'll also, I think, be able to report on that to say, you know, this is, this is the limit, this is where we looked and this is what we found. Um, and then I guess, you know, in terms of creating a definition, um, we can certainly do that. Um, I think, you know, for staff, as we're thinking about this, we're thinking about enforceability as well. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll likely have to choose to regulate PFAS that um, we can actually, um, we could actually conduct a laboratory test for or hire out those services. Um, so there are a couple of methods that have been developed by EPA um, that limits fairly substantially uh, what PFAS you can test for. They're mostly long chain PFAS um, uh, and about 14 to 18 different compounds um, that we'll, we'll, we would be able to test for using current methodologies. Um, it is the case that we, we will still likely, by the time January of next year rolls around, lack sufficient, relevant, and actionable toxicological data. Um, that's a conclusion that a number of other states have come to as well. And while um, we'd like to have that information, it just doesn't exist currently for pesticides. Um, and it's not, unfortunately, something we can uh, bring into existence um, in the immediate. It does exist for other things like water quality protection, for example. Um, it just hasn't, the science is still evolving and, um, you know, we're still learning new things. So um, hopefully at some point soon we'll have that information, but we likely won't have it by January. 
Um, so we'll likely come back with some proposals and information regarding um, how, what we can do with what we have, uh, I guess is, is more or less um, likely what I'll, I'll have to report back on or we'll have to report back on. Um, let's see. Oh, and uh, with regard to, <clears throat> I guess the question about have the BPC determine what would be necessary in order to regulate fluorinated surfactants. I think maybe just a little clarification there. I mean, are we talking about fluorinated adjuvants? Are we talking about um, adjuvants sold in fluorinated containers or adjuvants containing PFAS? So I wasn't sure if, if maybe we could have some clarification there on, as to what, what type of uh, potential PFAS contamination. Are we talking about containers? Are we talking about the active ingredients of the of the adjuvant being PFAS, both of those things? Yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we wanna know if, if they are being put into, we, we don't know if fluorinated surfactants are reacting with fluorinated con containers to create PFAS, um, but I was more worried about the, and I'm sorry, I'm using the word surfactants, I think when I should be using the word adjuvants. Uh, so, but fluorinated adjuvants by themselves might, um, have some PFAS in them. There, I've seen some studies where where some PFAS chains have been formed in there. Um, so that's what I'm looking for. Okay, I think <clears throat> I'm not sure. I mean, given that there are likely pesticides that also just contain fluorine, and it isn't necessarily a PFAS compound. I think for the same reason that that would be difficult to discern that PFAS are present. I mean, the only way that we would be able to tell you that PFAS are in an adjuvant that is not stating on the label or in some other capacity that it contains a PFAS compound that's recognized would be to test them all. Um, so we would actually have to, so it's about 500 bucks ish per test, I believe, um, for, uh, for the 14 or so compounds that can be detected um, with the uh, EPA, current EPA method, original PFAS method. <clears throat> Excuse me, froggy this morning. <clears throat> So I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, I, there are a lot of adjuvants. Um, so it, yeah. it would be the case that that would probably a fair, be a fairly gargantuan task. Um, you, I guess you could consider simply looking at whether or not the container's fluorinated or whether or not it has a declared PFAS. I mean, that would yeah. be closer to what and, and, asking for, for pesticides too. Yeah, and I'm just talking back and forth with you, but Mr. Chair, is it okay if I keep talking? Sure. Please. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you've been working on this, so. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah. The fluorinated adjuvants. I think that's where I just want to know the report back would say what would be necessary in order to regulate fluorinated adjuvants. And so there you could come back and say it would cost $20,000 and 800 hours of, of person time um, and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, and then we have a clearer picture of what's necessary. And that's why I don't want to necessarily write that um, statute or do that work right now because we prefer to do it in 2022 when we have a clearer sense of what's necessary. Okay. So that might include commenting on whether or not um, adjuvants are sold in PFAS, uh, fluorinated containers, or appear to contain PFAS as active ingredients. Is that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I would, and I would focus not on all adjuvants, but the fluorine, the ones that contain those long fluorine, um, that contain the fluorine chain that are fluorinated. Okay. Yeah. I'll come back to you, Representative Blucher, but we have some other hands up. Yes, uh, thank Representative you. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, okay, so I'm trying to follow all of the detail here. Um, um, I just think, I decided on just, just one of these meetings so that I could, um, which I appreciated the department holding um, with the AG's office. And it just seems like a simpler approach would be to put some of this in statute instead of go through this whole rulemaking process. I think it would be faster, just simpler to implement, um, gives you a stronger legal position. And I'm just trying to understand, um, I don't know, I'm kind of, I feel like we're getting lost in the weeds on some of this stuff and making it more complicated than it needs to be. So I'm wondering if, um, if you maybe could talk about of this data that, that you guys have been listing for the past 10 minutes, what um, what would manufacturers have already? Or you know, what's like a likely thing that these people have already? Because we've been throwing a lot of terms around and I think that um, part of what we're looking at here is 
the legislature has the ability to say to protect consumers, can you just tell us what's in your product? And we can put that in statute. Um, so I'm just wondering kind of, I guess what the committee feels and also if Megan could comment on some of the stuff that we could simplify. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that I see putting it in statute as simpler or faster necessarily. Um, you know, I think the board is going to begin looking into this in June at its June meeting, June 5th. Uh, so I, I think that arguably we'll likely begin the rulemaking process for collecting some of this information at that point. Um, and so the low hanging fruit here is at is the affidavits. Um, but those crafting what those should say and how they should say them. And we already have the authority. Frankly, we already have the authority and statute as well to collect those. Um, but but putting them in rule specifies what it is we're collecting so we can be really specific. So we will get into the weeds um, as a board in discussing this and exactly how they should be tailored and what they'll say. Um, but you know that that's a conversation I think we're comfortable having um, there and we have the time to have it. But, um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Um, Thanks. How long will that process take just to give us an, a timeline? Um, so I understand rulemaking can take three months or less. I mean, it depends on how many, how much discussion, how much public comment um, is offered, um, how much digestion has to take place. Awesome about rulemaking is that it's slow, it's own, you know, that it yeah, takes But I think it's actually, frankly, can happen faster than uh, legislative season takes place. I mean, it actually can happen during that course of that, you know, January to, to June period of time um, as well. So, you know, I, I guess... Um, and as soon as the board has voted on it, it does become effective. Um, there's no delay in implementation. That's good to know. Um, so is there a way that we could request some of this immediately via statute? And um, I don't know, I'm just trying to, to figure it out because it, it just sounds like maybe the process will be drawn out. But Yeah, I think the part that would require potentially some statutory authority as the piece around adjuvants. But at this point, we we still need to figure out what, what that process even looks like for us and what it would entail in terms of um, regulating regulating adjuvants, how that, how that would be done, what it would take. Um, it's just something we haven't we haven't explored. That makes sense that we would need to add something to statute there. Yeah, I think the, what I'm throwing out to the committee is maybe it would be faster to, to act via statute, whether you have the authority or not to request this information. So I just want to throw it out there as conversation continues. Representative Underwood. I think the, uh, good morning. I'm Joseph Underwood and District 147 in Prescott. Isle. And I think the Board of Pesticide Control does an excellent job as far as formulating policy on PFAST. And uh, they're working very well with Representative Pluker on putting everything together. So be patient on your lawmaking. Just because this committee can do something doesn't mean it has to. And um, bad law is, is, no law is better than bad law. And the, the big, the main question I had, main question I uh, had was, uh, could somebody, probably Megan, Director Patterson, if you could uh, uh, give us so the whole committee understands what adju adjuvants or what it is and to define it in uh, plain language, if you could, please. Thank you. Sure. Happy to. Um, thank you for the question, actually. Um, so adjuvants are essentially uh, compounds, um, chemicals that are added to a pesticide tank mix. Um, that's when you put pesticides in a spray device, and um, they serve some purpose to either make the, make the pH of the water um, a certain pH, right? If it's too acidic, they lower it. If it's too basic, right, they, they will, they'll change it. Um, it also will change the, the physics of droplets. So spray droplets, that's what comes out of your spray device. Um, so if, if your normal droplet would have, you know, water tension holding it into it in a tight ball, um, it actually will cause uh, the tension, water tension to sort of be um, reduced. And so it will cause the droplet to kind of spread out across the leaf surface. So it'll have better coverage of a leaf surface. Um, they also have 
penetrants, um, which cause, allow pesticide to better absorb into a surface. So they've served a whole number of different um, physical functions um, with regard to pesticide application and better, more efficacious <clears throat> pesticide application, but that's just a few of the things they'll do. Does that more or less accomplish? It's they're, they're, they're used in a really technical way to do all kinds of really, really helpful things with regard to better and more effective pesticide application, but essentially they're a chemical that's added to a pesticide mixture um, to help it do these things. Follow-up question. Sure. sure. Um, on the, how does PFAS, how do these uh, compounds fit into the mix of these adjuvants? Do they make them work better or worse, or, or is it an independent, some sort of independent uh, toxic material that's put into the uh, put into the mix of the spray? Is exactly how does how does these uh, uh, PFAS or P what um, how do they how do they fit in the equation? I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, that's Thank a good you. question. <clears throat> sure thing. Thank you. Um, that's a good question. It's not really clear to us exactly what. Um, role chemically or physically um, PFAS substances are serving when it comes to either the pesticide formulation or the um, potential adjuvants that would, you know, sort of serve other purposes within the formulation. Um, so that's something we're going to need to start looking into is what, what are these doing? What are, what function are they serving? But with regard to PFAS in general, I mean, they do, they're used for a number of things that society has found um, useful over time. So whether it's um, Greaseproof paper and preventing, you know, grease from soaking through a piece of paper to, um, you know, Teflon coating, uh, making making a surface very uh, reducing friction on surfaces. Um, they're used in industry in the same way um, in, you know, production lines, for example, where you have a friction point, you might use a PFAS coating. Um, laboratories use them. Um, there are a number of different facilities that are are benefiting from, well, basically the ways in which PFAS either change the, the, the surface that is um, a material is being run across. Um, for example, if you have like a, I don't know, um, a high friction point in a construction line and you're concerned about that overheating, you might use PFAS to coat something to reduce friction in that friction point. Um, they're used in lots of other ways that make a variety of surfaces. I can send you some very good literature that talks about all the ways in which we use PFAS, if you like. <laughs> they're numerous, they're numerous ways. Thank you very much and uh, please do. Sure. Okay, I'll come back to Representative Pluker. Okay, um, I just wanted to clarify, um, oh, I might've lost it. Uh, was what the registration process for pesticides begins in November. So if we're looking to get uh, ideas of what formulation, um, what is involved in the formulation of these pesticides, that's a good time for the board of pesticide control to start collecting this information. Um, and so that was one point. And then once they've collected the information in November, then they, we can have it as part of the report back where we can actually do some of the statutory changes in January. Um, and if the committee is, is ready, we have a long day ahead of us and we might, I'm going to move out to pass as amended. Is there a second? Seconded by Senator Maxman. Discussion? Representative Underwood. I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Karen. You're muted, Karen. So um, the first two bullets requesting affidavits, mm -hmm. um, I think you may need, whether it's by rule or by statute, um, you know, that the board has authority to request those. Um, I think you would still need a statutory change to make it clear what their rulemaking authority is in this regard. What and what would that look like, Karen? Um, I'm I'm not sure yet. I mean, but just a, just a general statement that um, 
you know, the board um, may collect information or, you know, I guess we don't need to mention affidavits because that's, I guess, could be the method and rule. But I think um, you need to make the rulemaking authority more clear um, that you're requiring this additional information from manufacturers. I, I believe, didn't uh, Director Patterson say they already had the authority in statute to collect affidavits uh, on this I missed, information? I missed that. And if and she could point me to the statute, that would be great. I Director think the attorney. Patterson, yeah, just a second. Director Patterson, did you already have the authority to request a. You do. Yeah, so um, essentially, when it comes to uh, the registration process, we can request a number of different documents, everything from confidential statements of formula to, to affidavits. There was some question initially about affidavits, um, but since then I've had, um, Mag, um, my apologies, Representative O'Neill and Representative Pluker were present for one of the conversations um, with uh, AAG Randlett, and um, then I had my own conversation with him regarding our potential rulemaking. Um, and he indicated that we just need to put it in rule and could do so under current authorities. So where is the current authority? It's under the mm, uh, 607 and then... Yeah, between 604 and 609 in Title Seven. Okay. Uh, let's see, next is Representative O'Neill. Oh, thanks. That was kind of a lingering hand, but I think what I wanted to say for the motion is why don't we just say that we direct the BPC to do X and then if we find out we don't need it, we can strike it, but I don't see it hurting anything. Okay, Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can we identify what we're gonna be voting? I'm a little confused on where we're at with this, I, I believe, resolve. Uh, so I'd like it clarified of what we're voting on here, if I could. Thank you. I, I think that's where Karen was starting to go, but I'm not sure when you started with section one. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm just going, would I, essentially what Representative Pluker went through, um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bullets. So, um, I can go through those now, but I don't think too much has changed other than to clarify, uh, have the BPC determine what would be necessary in order for them to regulate fluorinated adjuvants. Um, Director Patterson wanted clarification on that, but um, I can go through this again or... I think we're going to have to go through this again, Karen, sorry, because I think there is confusion where we left it. And I think there may still be questions for the department of are these things doable? Um, you know, if we tell them even in a resolve, um, we've already heard some feedback from the director that, uh, uh, you know, there may be gaps in some of these places, but I want them to be clear what we're doing as well as us. Um, there's no sense in putting a resolve in here and telling them to do something that, you know, can't be done. So okay, go, go through those bullets, please. Sure. So um, the first two, uh, the first one is request affidavits of manufacturers and distributors as to whether the registered pesticide has ever been stored, distributed, or packaged in a fluorinated HDPE container. And, um, I, you know, I just had a question about that. If I guess they're hearing uh, the, the board and their assistant AG feel like they have, or they do have that existing authority and statute. I just had a question about that. And um, so I would probably connect the dots to that authority in the resolve so that it's clear where the authority lies. And then uh, request affidavits of manufacturer whether PFAS is in the formulation of the pesticides. So far, so good. Okay, um, and then um, the resolve would continue to direct the board to determine if any fluorinated surfactants 
are being used, sold in the state of Maine? Should it be ad adjuvants? Yes, okay. thank you. And then um, direct the board to create a feasible definition of PFAS adulteration in a pesticide. Be before you go beyond this one, uh, I remember when that was brought up before Director Patterson asked if this was all adjuvants or just for aerial application because that would make a huge difference on probably on the number of affidavits. It certainly would if there had to be any testing done but on the affidavit, it may or may not make any difference. And I would go back to Director Patterson. If it's only an affidavit, is that what that one says, Karen, an affidavit? Uh, no. On Request affidavits of whether PFAS is in the formulation of pesticides. No, yes. and one about adjuvants. You just said surfactants so oh. and could be changed uh, back. That's the one I'm, I, I'm questioning. What does that one uh, say? No, it just has... To, there's no affidavit involved in that one. What does it say again? Uh, directs the board to determine if any fluorinated adjuvants are being used, sold in the state of Maine. All right, Director Patterson, how would you do that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I guess, you know, as I mentioned, we would likely begin with an assumption, although it's an assumption and I would argue it probably is not going to give you a complete picture, but an assumption that we would look at pesticide distributors, pesticide retailers, um, and assume that they are also distributing surfactants or adjuvants. Um, so, I, I mean, that, that may not provide a complete picture. Um, and we likely would have to do a data call in, I guess, um, is like is the, how that would look. Um, but yeah, I guess we need to we need to work through what what that would look like. I mean, part of the process of attending to this resolve would be figuring out exactly how we would accomplish the task. Um, I'm not sure that we've we have we have a better sense of how we might request affidavits and how that would look for um, pesticide formulations. Um, but with regard to adjuvants, we just have we've not regulated them before. It's a brand new area for us. So what I'm getting at is this something with the way it's written right now or stated, is that something that's doable? Yeah. Or so, need so more clarification? Yeah, I think, you know, as I'd mentioned, you know, it'd be very helpful to know if we're talking about it, not just with the adjuvants piece, but also with the pesticide um, formulations piece. If we're talking about, you know, 13,000 pesticides, and however many adjuvants there are, or if we're talking about those materials used in aerial application, um, because that's what the original bill referred to. Um, so I think ha having that clarification, certainly we think um, working in the con context of aerial application is achievable. Um, 13,000 products, pesticide products, plus however many adjuvants there are, um, seems like a bit more of a stretch for what we could what we could accomplish in a, uh, how many months? In six months. I would go back to Representative Fluker since it was his bill and it's aerial application. What is the thought there? The, my idea was that because we're not taking any statutory movement at this point, that it's best to get the information on the entire body of, of chemicals. Okay. Um, we've heard some conversation in this committee. Why do we keep picking on aerial application when we're not really worried about aerial application as much as we're worried about pesticide use in general. I've also heard, you know, some conversations, why are we picking on, on commercial conventional pesticides when this, and especially when we're looking at HTP containers, this could just as easily have, uh, be something that affects organic pesticides. And I'm sure organic growers would want to know if this was something that was happening that they could potentially uh, be misapplying or um, so to me, it, it does, it does, it should affect, it could have, it would make sense to look at what's being applied, no matter how it's being applied. Okay. Karen, the next bullet. Um, okay, so we're... I think maybe right. so, four. So uh, require the board create a feasible definition of PFAS adulteration in a pesticide. We're going to keep it to all, not just aerial. Is that correct? Yes. I would, okay, I see yeah, not. I would expect okay. the definition is the definition of, you know. Yep. 
Okay. Um, and then requires the board to determine what would be necessary in order for them to regulate fluorinated adjuvants. Um, and then require the board uh, to de determine what would be necessary to, to ensure it is illegal to distribute or apply pesticides or, or adjutants uh, containing PFAS in the state of Maine. Yes. Okay. I, I would ask Megan on that one again. Would you say that one again, Karen, please? Um, require the board to determine um, what would be necessary. And I, I may phrase this a little differently, but uh, yes, to please. ensure it is illegal to distribute or apply pesticides or adjutants containing PFAS in the state of Maine. Okay. Okay. And then finally, uh, require the board to report back to the ACF committee um, in, I don't know, I'll say, I, I don't know what a report, a good report back date is, but they report back to this committee and then this committee would have authority to submit a bill. Um, the revisor's office is having, uh, has had us put report back dates in December. I don't know, that may be too soon for the purposes of this particular resolve. So I could say January 15. I don't know if that works for the board and looks like it works for the sponsor. So that's the amendment. Other questions? I uh, would just throw out one and I guess it's probably maybe Megan, maybe Karen. Um, I'm not sure, but um, if we, uh, e either way, I'm, there'll be votes for this, whether it's up or down, I'm not sure. It doesn't matter at this point for my question. Um, do you anticipate a huge fiscal note on this? That seems like there's an awful lot in there. And I know it's hard to speculate, but I guess that might go back to the department or um, what they think they'll need to do all this. And yeah, I guess at this point it's, it's um, unclear. I, I think I was um, anticipating that this would be focused on aerial application. Um, as, as the original text said. Um, so I think in order to accomplish it in the short time frame, um, there may be a fiscal note, um, but I guess that's, yeah, I'm just not sure. Um, I'll have to take a closer look at this and maybe have conversation with uh, folks in the department to see what it will take. Okay. I'm just wondering uh, about that aspect of it. I, I, I'm, I hear what uh, Representative Pluka had said that, uh, you know, we've all been kind of dancing around sticking to Aereo and not sticking to Aereo. Or, um, but in this case, I'm wondering if we start with Aereo, that may give us a, a good starting point um, that would make it a, uh, maybe a more uh, chance of getting it done and in, in, in information that we are looking for. Um, so that uh, when we do go to put in a bill, if we do, um, that it may be something that uh, would, you know, build on what is done here. Um, because I hate to have us go through all this and they come back to us and it's either a huge fiscal note because they're looking at 13,000 products plus adjuvants or if they're looking at, uh, you know, a much smaller number. number. And I would ask that of Representative Fluker. I mean, I'm fine if that's where you want to stay, Representative, with all 13,000 products where the bill was aerial to begin with. But um, I just would hope that we could get something that's doable here. Should we, I mean, do we want to hold it until we get a fiscal note given, reported back to us? Or we, or we could vote now and then, and then, um, and then address the physical fiscal note when it comes back later. Okay. Or, or I guess that's more of a question. What, what do you think, Senator Dill? Well, I, I don't know. I'm just concerned with 13,000 products plus I don't know how many thousands of adjuvants. Um, 
I, I, I'm afraid that we're really giving, giving the board a task um, that they may not be able to um, do in basically six months, seven months, whatever it is until January 15th. Um, and I would go back to Megan perhaps and, um, you know, we're talking, if we're talking aerial chemicals, Megan, off the top of your head, you have a rough estimate how many chemicals you'd be talking about, pesticides you'd be talking about. You know, I guess, so <clears throat> in terms of, of where this is focused, I think what we were originally thinking um, was the focus of the original bill was current, current use. Um, so what products are currently being used in aerial application in Maine? Right. Um, so that's a pretty, it's a pretty narrow scope. It gives us sort of a, essentially a case study format to look at um, some of the questions that we don't have answers to um, at present, you know, um, and figuring out what, what it is we don't know um, with regard to toxicology and otherwise. Um, and then also with adjuvants, same thing, you know, it gives us the opportunity to kind of use those as a case study to figure out what it is we need to know to be effective in regulating the larger array of chemistries. Um, so, you know, it, with those, it's probably um, in the last, I don't know, five or six years, uh, I think in the reports that I gave you for the two applicators that are currently licensed to do aerial application in the state of Maine, I think they had used in 2019 something like seven different products total, um, but they don't use the same products every year. So it would be sort of looking at maybe the array of products they might have used over a period of time. Um, but it gives us sort of a nice subset of, of pesticides to look at. Um, if we had to try to base it off of whether or not a pesticide could be used via aerial application, that's, that's a lot trickier um, because each label would have to be read, reviewed, um, determined if they specifically prohibited aerial application. Unfortunately, there's no nice way to find that information unless you actually read each and every label. Um, so uh, I, would, I would suggest that, you know, looking at current use um, in aerial application does give us a nice narrow scope. Um, to be able to use as, again, like a case study, to be able to term, determine in, you know, in this narrow focus, what is it we determined we actually needed to do or needed to know or didn't know and might not know anytime soon. Representative Osher. It seems to me that shouldn't the companies that sell these products be able to have that information, they should get it to you. So it seemed like the cost would be that receiving and organizing that information as opposed to actually reading labels. Um, yeah, because you think. Um, if they're, they're in, you know, the, we're, we're investigating whether or not those products can be sold in the state. So it gives them uh, incentive to assist you in the process of telling you about their, their commodity that they're trying to sell in our state because we now have a question about the safety for, for people in our state. So I don't, I don't know how you come up with the fiscal note, but it seems to me that whether we did it just on the, the products that have been a, a sprayed in the last couple of years or on all products that that the, the challenge to the Board of Pesticides Control is organizing that information. But it, I don't, it seems like just requesting that information and getting someone else to send it to you is the, would be a, a good first step. Representative Underwood. Hi, Director Patterson, when would you get all the material together that you would need to know to make a decision or to formulate some sort of idea on how to process this, this, uh, this particular bill? Um, as far as uh, if you can't do it now, uh, would you need another year or two years or how, how much time would be involved in here in order to, for you to get the material that you need? Yeah, I guess. Do you mean with regard to aerial application, or or as or pesticides? All all pesticide products that are registered in the state of Maine. All, all pesticide products. So I think it's it's not. Um, well, it will be a new requirement, and new requirements always take time to implement and get everybody on board. So that's a consideration, I think. Right? You don't have you know 100% adoption immediately. Um, that doesn't actually typically happen. Um, you. Uh, I think we easily could incorporate the components related to affidavits into our registration process, um, which is a right now we're, we work with a technological solution. So everybody submits their registration applications online. So that that I don't actually foresee as as much of the problem. 
it is then, um, you know, if there's any expectation that we confirm this information or review this information to any great extent, um, then of course there's going to be additional additional burden. Um, so I guess it, different parts of this will take more time, other parts will take less, right? So figuring out um, a regulatory framework to regulate a new area like adjuvants will take more time. Um, something like um, implementing the requirement for an affidavit to be submitted as a part of the registration review process, that's not going to take as much time. Um, we can incorporate that component of requirement into our current registration review process or re registration submission process. Um, so I'm not sure I fully answered your question, but um, when it comes to all of these requirements, um, there are pieces of information here that no one currently has, not just we don't have it. I mean, it doesn't exist as information. Um, it's it's an area of science that's emerging, trying to figure out, you know, what level of PFAS is of toxicological significance. It's that's still being researched. Um, it is being actively researched, but it's still being researched. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Dill. Is the uh, is the uh, next session? Is it something that could be tabled at the current time to, to get her? to make sure you well, that to give her more time in order to request the information that she needs that, that uh, wouldn't help i mean the resolve is telling them to get us the information to bring it back to us for next session so um we may as well go ahead and instruct them on what we want so this bill is is exactly what is is being done so um, are you in favor would you would you think tabling tabling this would be a uh, would be a good idea or just or take a vote on this? I think we should eventually take a vote on this probably today, as soon as we can, as soon as all the discussion is done. Thank you. Yep. Um, next is Representative O'Neill. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm trying to get back to what my question was because we've been bouncing around a little bit. Um, I think, oh my God. Oh, so I heard during the conversation, this is just one question that emerged, was when is registration for Director Patterson? So um, registration, product registration is annual um, and it expires December 31st of every year. Um, so companies generally try, they can begin renewing in November, um, but they'll continue renewing for several months after that. Um, so we'll continue to get applications for renewal. Most of them are processed by mid-January, um, but there are always stragglers. It isn't, uh, you know, they do come in late from time to time. Um, and then of course, any renewal, so new product registrations. Um, so it's maybe important to understand that while we have typically annually 13,000 products registered, we also have turnovers. We lose about a thousand product registrations each year. Companies just choose not to re-register their products. They don't manufacture them, they replace them with something else. Um, and then they'll have, we replace them with about a thousand new products each year. So those are brand new registrations, brand new products that we then review and, and register um, or refuse registration to. That happens as well. And what form do you receive this information in? Yeah, it's all, it's electronic. Um, so at this point, uh, it comes into our system. It's called MePearls. Um, so main pesticide enforcement uh, registration and licensing system. Um, it's a lot packed into that acronym, uh, but basically we run all of those components, the registration enforcement and licensing components of our program through MePearls. Um, and with regard to the current data that we collect, um, it's, it's pretty typical data that's collected in the pesticide registration process by most states. Um, <clears throat> we, um, I think I, I think that's enough. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. <laughs> Registration scintillating, but you know. <laughs> um, so I think, so if I can understand, just we talked about a fiscal note, but really this is adding another box that people would have to say, is this in your formulation? Is this, you know, in your inert substances or something like that? Yeah, I think, I mean, with regard to the the affidavits, um, it's, it's as simple as, uploading a document, um, I think, I think it could be as simple as uploading a document. Now, when it comes to some of these other parts though, um, in this list of um, asks, um, in terms of trying to enforce against some of these components, I mean, I guess 
if that's the intention of this group. Now you could make something that we don't enforce against, I suppose, or or it's a paper exercise of simply, are you declaring this contains PFAS? If yes, then we don't register your product. Um, I do think there, I mean, and I think we've um, represented Fluker and I have discussed the potential for challenges to that, particularly when we can't um, test for certain compounds. Um, if, and that's where definitions become important is to trying to figure out what we actually can look for. Um, but even when we can look for something, currently there is no uh, sort of, whether you want to call it a tolerance or an actionable level, um, that information is still lacking and likely will continue to be lacking for some time. Um, so there are, we do have some questions around that. Um, and then in terms of adjuvants, um, that is a whole other component of our program. That's essentially taking us from just regulating pesticides and saying, now you also regulate this other area of, of chemistry. Um, so that likely would require additional staff. Understood. And um, so what, um, if folks could submit this already and, and you likely have some kind of database of companies, would you be able to take um, this information sooner than that? Because I think part of what we're talking about is timeline. When we talked about statute versus rulemaking, we were saying there's a benefit to doing it this way. You could complete it in the next three months could start receiving this information. And now you're saying that part of your plan was to start receiving this information in December or January. So just our concern to, is to protect public health by getting this information. So I wanna make sure we, we can get it moving. So what would be a way that we could um, request this sooner? So I think what I was saying is that we'd start the rulemaking process um, and the rulemaking process would of course have to be completed for us to then execute it. Um, and we would execute it as a part of our normal registration process. So uh, I definitely would consider a fiscal note if we were asking information from all, for all 13,000 products in advance of the registration renewal um, process. That's, we have one registrant, we likely would need to hire additional staff um, to, to execute that work. And would that be because it requires mail? Because, because I'm guessing you, what do you email people? How do you notify them? Yeah, so we do email people. Um, there's a significant amount of late work though that's required. So somebody is going to need to be available to answer all of their questions. Um, that's a major component of, of implementing anything. You know, that's, that's actually a significant component of what we do as a program is being present to answer questions, um, whether it's interpretation of rule or answer, answering questions about, you know, how to use me pearls, how to register your product. Um, that's a significant part of, of what every, every state agency does, I would believe. Okay. And do you expect that you would be sending this information out early anyhow when you complete the rule process, be, just because it's new information and you said sometimes you have stragglers into the year. So maybe you would want to provide folks with that information and give your own staff time to yeah. um, answer questions and work with folks so that they can do the testing they need to get this new information to me. Um, <clears throat> I mean, typically we start informing people about, I mean, we inform, we inform licensed applicators about legislation that's taking place. Um, we have a mailing list for, um, for registrants um, of pesticides to, you know, let them know when we have rule changes. Um, so there's a very good chance that we would um, begin communication about this sooner than later, particularly as a part of the rulemaking process so that, um, you know, registrants would have an opportunity to have their voices heard. Um, with regard to whatever it is we ultimately develop. Um, so I think, you know, that's not unusual for us to communicate in that way to make sure um, impacted individuals have a chance to speak. Okay. So would, um, I'm just hearing kind of two things, like you're, you're keeping folks updated already par as part of the rulemaking process, but, and yeah. that wouldn't require a fiscal note, but it would to, to start it early. I just want to see if it's possible. So, so I think what, what it sounds like to me I'm being asked to do is to, or our program's being asked to do is to have essentially two, two approaches, do registration once and essentially do it again in the same year. So have a process they go through once to submit documentation and then have them then enter into registration renewal a second time starting in November. Is that, am I not perceiving that correctly? I'm just trying to understand your process because you're saying that you engage in a lot of communication with all the stakeholders anyway. So maybe maybe there's a way to send that out just so that we can make sure we get the 
info sooner. So are, but are we asking for the affidavits? Um, and maybe this is, are we asking for the affidavits as a I'm part of the registration? I'm getting more info for the committee. I'm not mandating anything. I'm just, just getting info. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess I, I'm not sure I'm clear on, um, on what I, what I'm being asked is the request or is the suggestion that we would ask for the affidavits in advance of the registration renewal process, or we'd ask for them as a part of registration renewal? I think what I'm trying to understand is the timeline, the costs involved, the communication you're already engaged in with folks that you've named under the rulemaking process, and would it be possible to include communication saying, this is our new rule, this is what you're going to have to comply with so that folks will be ready to comply right away. I think that's not a problem. I think it's, I think what, what it was sounding like is we were going to ask them to submit that information in advance of registration renewal, as opposed to communicating with them about changes to the renewal process, not the timeline, but actually, um, but change, changes not to the process itself, but to also the timeline of when they had to renew, um, that they might have to submit information earlier than November. Is that... Yes, but I'm, yes, I think, I think we get it. Yeah, so that would be possible just based on my question instead of repeating. We, we would need additional staff to, to be able to handle, I think that additional push for getting everybody on board, getting everybody on in the process of submitting information early. I don't know that our system is actually set up to be able to accept documents more than two months in advance. I mean, that's true. It's true for our licensing process for our, um, commercial applicators. It may also be the case that it's set up that way that it begins in November because we don't want them submitting their registration rules earlier than November. Otherwise they're trying to do it in J June for 2022. Um, so we, we avoid having that sort of crossover, um, but I'm, yeah. That makes sense. So you answered my question, which is you're in regular communication with folks and they could have the chance to get this info and, and work on getting it ahead of the registration so that they could be prepared to register and it wouldn't delay the process. We, we certainly can communicate with folks and inform them of any changes to the, to the process for sure. Okay. Thanks for going through that. Representative McCray, then Pluker, then Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Director Patterson, this is just very, very simple. Uh, I think it was Representative Underwood that asked to have information on adjutants uh, sent. Do you plan on sending that to all of us? Um, I can, and it's uh, it's well. not so much on adjutants, but on, um, I, I, there are a couple of papers that have been written recently about um, the ways in which PFAS are used. So it's not actually even specifically tailored to pesticides. Um, that that was what I was referring to. But if you'd like information on adjuvants, I'm happy to find some and send it to you. I would love it. I've, I've been going online. I can't really find it under this under this application of that word. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Thank happy you. To. Okay. Thank you very much. That's it. Representative Pluker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it was not my intention that uh, there be a like a two side by side registration processes um, this in 2021. Uh, what I was imagining was that just as the person fills out their regular registration forms uh, for the state of Maine, they could click a couple boxes. Do you promise that you've never, this is, or get, has this been stored or distributed in, H, in fluorinated HDPE containers? Another box, is there any PFOS in your formulation? Um, so if it seems that we might be able to just put this all together in the same package that currently exists. Um, it's just a, a couple extra boxes on the list. And um, that was my intent behind this, not to um, require more, um, a whole nother process that I understood would require more staff. So the question, I guess, to Director Patterson, is it possible or would you see this as possibly just being able to be included in your regular, regular registration questions and process? Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, I think that's um, part of the comments I sent to you. Um, we're basically more or less saying that we will begin discussing this, this anyway, these affidavits in June um, at the June board meeting. Um, so I, I do think it's possible. I think 
that I also like having um, sort of group discussion to brainstorm best how, how best to do accomplish that. So we're not creating undue burden, um, but also accomplishing the task, right? I think that's, that's always an important consideration um, with regard to, you know, making sure people are willing to comply as well, right? That's part of it. Um, making it possible and accomplishable helps with compliance. Um, so, so yes, I think that can be incorporated easily into the um, registration process. Um, that particular documentation shouldn't be a problem. I do think we'll need to create rules around it though, as, as um, suggested by the AAG, um, that that would make sense because we're, we're making this uh, an across the board requirement as a part of the registration process that we would need to, to develop some rules. Um, but that would certainly be in time for the registration season. I don't foresee any issues um, there. I had a far follow up or a, a separate <laughs> issue. Um, what is the fund where the registration uh, payments go into that BPC holds? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the name of it, I, I know the, the accounting codes, um, but what I'm not going to say code? those right now. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Or, or what is the accounting code? Um, so I, I will send you the name. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so I was just thinking if we could put, if there did look like there was going to be additional cost for this, is it, we could put this, put it in the resolve that that cost would come out of those funds as a, as I was going to ask you if there's balance in there right now. Oh yeah. So there is. Um, so we do have a, a, a minor, well, some would say a substantial surplus, I would say, uh, likely quickly diminishing, um, yeah, I mean, you, I think you, I've been told, I think in front of this committee, not necessarily by you, Representative Pfluger, but by others that um, essentially you can do as you like, I think, with regard to um, to demanding um, that we use existing funding. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think Representative Pfluger earlier on today uh, uh, in this discussion kind of brought this back to, to the resolve and to try to move this along. Um, I think that, you know, we tend, you know, this is a complicated issue. Um, and I think we tend to get in the weeds uh, too much. I think uh, we fully don't understand all the department has to go through here. Um, you know, the resolve to me um, has moved me in the area where I could probably support this. Uh, um, I think that it would be better to limit it to aerial spray. And even though I heard Representative Pluka's comment uh, earlier about, you know, we uh, have talked about, you know, keeping it away from just aerial, you know, we've been diverting from aerial spray into everything. But I think this one, um, to get this started and to move this forward and get get something out of it, I would think that we would try to uh, keep it to aerial spray. And um, um, I think that, you know, we need to be considerate of what the uh, note is going to be on it, the financial note on this, because I think if you go to the 13,000 and do what some are suggesting, there is going to be a substantial, substantial cost to it. So that's my comment. I, I would go back to Megan again on that. Um, I, I kind of agreed to that, um, but with what Representative Pluka just said to you, is it as simple as checking a couple boxes on the registration form of the 13,000 products that has this been stored in uh, fluorinated um, containers or does it contain PFAS? If that's as simple as it is, then I could go along with all 13,000. If it's much more complicated than that, I would stick, personally, I would stick to Ariel to give us a point um, that I think you, the board, can actually accomplish between now and January 15th. So I would throw that to you to try to get an answer before we go back to Representative Pluker. Sure. I think, you know, for me, it's not, it, it's more when I'm thinking about some of the other questions related to adjuvants and trying to explore some of the unknowns. That's where, that's where the, the cost lies. Um, if it is, in fact, if we're not enforcing against any of this, if you're just asking us for the information about the 13,000 products, submit your affidavit and we then do nothing um, with regard to PFAS. Uh, 
you know, there is a, there is a cost to building that functionality into our system. There's always a cost. We work through a, a company that, um, called Stratosphere that actually does all of our development for us within our system. Um, so certainly there will be some sort of um, cost associated with building in the functionality. Um, so there's, the, there's a real cost there, no matter what we do, there's a real cost there for asking for that information. Um, if we have to do some kind of review um, of any of this content, then there's definitely um, a cost there. Um, so it's going to be a staffing cost, something that we don't currently, um, don't currently have to, it's something that we don't currently have to do. It's going to be additional work for our registrant and our registrant already is maxed out. So if um, it's just a matter of them either providing it or not, um, saying, confirming they have PFAS or not, um, and there's no expectation of, of digestion of that information or chasing of that information or answering questions related to that information, um, then no. Uh, the only cost I can foresee is again programming in that functionality into our existing system. If we then do have to answer lots of questions or provide information about specifically PFAS and why they're having to report on it, which will be well, most companies at this point are aware of what's happening with pesticide products um, and that PFAS was found as a part of a possibly the containerization process um, and the fluorination of those containers. Um, you know, there, there could be an, a cost associated with, with having to answer those questions, with having to walk people through that process. Um, currently our pesticide registrant, um, you know, is, is maxed out. Um, she, we had to recently hire a, a, a temp to assist her with just the existing process, right? So, so it, is, it is a demanding job and um, currently the current process does require a lot of um, time. So, so Megan, then it sounds like the adjuvants may be more of a holdup. The adjuvants that is could. something you don't regulate. And whereas right. you regulate the pesticides, it may be as simple as what Representative Pluka said. Yep. So the adjuvants seems to be an issue. However, right. the way I understood this, and maybe uh, Representative Pluka, you may be able to correct this. My understanding of this was you would gather this information, report back to us January 15th, then as a committee, we would then report out a statute that is enforceable. A resolve does not have anything in it that's enforceable. Um, so if we make this a resolve, as we said, you're off the hook as far as enforcement goes. You're just reporting back to us on January 15th. Is that the case, Representative Kluger? Yes, that's right. It's just a, it's just gathering information, reporting back. No additional regulation. So we I'm fine asking. where yes, I'm fine where we are. I don't know where everybody else is, but I think uh, maybe we can move on if you can okay. just put that simply, Representative Kluger. Yeah, and I just want to to be clear to to Senator Black that this is not going to represent any cost to the general fund. If there is cost, we can make it clear that it's coming out of the fund that we were just talking about that holds the registration money. Any other Plan questions? Any other questions? Cheryl, please call the roll. LD uh, 264 ought to pass as amended. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black, yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. You need to be on. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Representative Maggie O'Neill, yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. No. Representative Joseph Underwood, no. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford. Yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, yes. Representative Susan Bernard. Uh, I am here and, oh goodness, hang on just a moment. Yes, please. Representative Susan Bernard, yes. 
Representative David McRae. He had to leave. I texted him, but okay. didn't get back in time. Representative David McRae, absent. So the minority report, Representative Underwood? Ought not to pass. Thank you. So that's Water. 11, ought to yep. pass as amended. Yep. 11 ought to pass as amended, one ought not to pass, and one absent. Okay, on LD uh, 264, an act to prohibit aerial application of pure floral alkyl and polyfloral alkyl uh, compounds. Um, ought to pass as amended, 11 1 1. And I will close the hearing on LD 264. And we'll move right along on to LD 524, an act to, so I'll open the, pub, uh, the work session on 524, an act to require schools to submit pest management activity logs to the Board of Pesticides Control and Postal Inspection Results for the purpose of providing information to the public. Yeah. Uh, this was tabled about a month ago. Okay, can I have a motion to take it off the table, please? Moved by Representative Hall, seconded by Landry, all in favor? off the table. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so this bill is a reintroduction of a bill from the 129th. Um, it's identical to LD 908. So it establishes in law certain requirements of the Board of Pesticides Control uh, re related to pest management on school property. Um, and it requires a school to maintain a pest management activity log re related to the application of pesticides. Uh, this information um, must be provided annually to the board and the board um, is required to po post this information on its publicly accessible website. And it also requires that the board post on uh, the website a list of all board inspections of a school's use of pesticides and the results of those inspections. So um, we had a work session on this uh, previously. Um, the sponsor did have some suggested amendments, um, perhaps, well, primarily turning this act into a resolve, um, directing uh, the board to make this information more publicly available and to, to determine and develop the best, best methods to accomplish this and maybe limit to a few key of the most toxic carcinogenic pesticides. Um, and I just, you know, if you do fo move forward with the bill as drafted, um, I just want to identify for you that um, LD 908 and the 129th was identified as a potential state mandate. Um, and so I'm assuming that would happen again with this bill as, as drafted. Um, but I think what the ACF committee did um, last time is you did sort of put in your summary of uh, your amendment that you, the committee um, didn't feel that it was a mandate. So for whatever that's worth, but anyway, I'll just um, leave it at that for, for now. Other questions for Karen? What, again, would you say that again, Karen, that last bit about the mandate? We passed it, but then yeah, so it, uh, it, uh, it was identified as a potential state mandate. Um, uh, and so um, what the committee did is you just included in your summary that the committee um, felt like it wasn't a state mandate essentially, but it, it may require a mandate preamble, which as you know, requires um, either the state provide 90% of the funding or the legislature votes to establish an exemption by two thirds vote of each chamber. Okay. Other questions for Karen? Senator Black. Karen, do you have the, uh, what was the vote? Do you have that from last session? I believe it was unanimous uh, to pass. Um, it was a straight ought to pass, but it was a fiscal no only amendment. Thank you. 
Director Patterson, you still there? Wouldn't, wouldn't want you to escape again, you know, on me, so. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself, please. Sure. I've just wanted to check in with you. Um, this is information that's basically all be already being collected uh, by the school system. And what does this do to the board that they're not already doing? So at present, as is the case with um, all pesticide use records, um, with the exception of the end of year summary reports that we're, we receive, um, it's just maintained at the school level. So it's, it's not something that is um, automatically sent to the board each year. So this would require all the schools now to send it to you. That's right. And you would then post it. Um, well, I don't know what the amendment reads, but yes, I mean, the current liter the current language of the bill, yes, re would require them to submit their logs, which can be pretty lengthy. Um, and I think um, Dr. Murray expressed during the hearing also that, um, I believe she expressed this, although it may have just come from other conversations we've had, that some of the schools, um, particularly the IPM coordinators, in some instances lack access to and maybe even a, a knowledge of how to use um, some of the you know, multifunction machines, for example, um, to be able to scan, um, send documentation that's all written, um, maintained in a written record. So I think there was some concern about them sending that. I think there was also concern and that's maybe a part of the amendment about sending uh, records for every time they apply disinfectants and sanitizers, um, particularly with COVID, you know, they're applying them many times a day, every day. Um, in many different locations. And each of those applications in say a different classroom would be technically a different element of their log. It would be a different line item in the log. Um, so I think there was concern about having to send that just quantity of information to the BPC. Thank you, Karen. What does the amendment do? Does that eliminate any of that? Does it, what does it do on how often they have to, is it an annual? submission of the logs? Is it weekly? Is it daily? Every application or what? Uh, well, right now there's not really an amendment. I mean, the sponsor yep. okay. had a couple different approaches, you know, the resolve or if the committee moves forward with the bill, she asked that you provide a public health exemption. Um, obviously, um, schools need to act quickly during a pandemic. But um, the department has su some suggestions um, for the original bill, clarify the use of the term species, uh, school property is not defined, um, and strike certification numbers. But there's really no amendment. And just a reminder, you know, the, um, the board has authority to adopt routine technical rules to implement that provision so they could figure out you know. The, What's the best way to? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, and the sponsor of the bill had suggested a, a resolve to do that? Well, Just, go ahead. I mean, this, you know, we're almost talking a couple months ago now. So, right. I, I mean, I think if there was um, discomfort with moving forward with the statutory changes, um, that would be another option, I guess, that um, she put forward to the committee. Um, and the department also stated in their testimony, because there will be questions on how to best design and implement uh, this online reporting requirement, uh, the committee may consider changing this bill to a resolve, directing the board to research and implement workable methods for doing so in a, ma a manner that provides data in a clear and useful uh, format and then maybe uh, report back to the committee. Okay, thank you. Senator Maxman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, I'm sorry if this was said, but I just wanted to make sure that um, it, it exempts hand sanitizer and disinfecting products. I know that was, I've heard that as a concern from my, from my school districts. I think the sponsor mentioned it too. Yeah, I think it was, uh, one of the things we should exempt is public health products. Okay. So that okay. would include just those things you mentioned. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
And I, I, I think, you know, personally, if we did this as a resolve, I think that would be uh, a helpful way to go. Let them report back to us on what they came up or what they have come up with for a reporting mechanism. But uh, that's kind of where I sit. Uh, other questions for Karen or Director Patterson? Does somebody want to make a motion here? There. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so something I wanted to float um, that I brought up earlier was just as a matter of um, of order. Um, we have a bill that is coming and the sponsor has um, given us an amendment. And in my mind, um, what I've heard, you know, spending five years on this committee is that um, Director Patterson has said that these records exist on paper and that, um, and that when we request aggregate kind of information, um, we're not able to do that in a cost-effective manner. Um, and that just for informational purposes, like folks at universities and stuff like that, um, that might want to access it don't have it. So uh, the way I'm looking at it is that um, if we were to vote for an amended version of the bill that's coming, it would cover this concern for me. Because um, what I've seen still do Why is- Why don't you table this, Representative O'Neill, and we'll just flip it around and we'll take okay. it up after. Yeah, I mean, that works for me. All right, you want to make that table it. All right, is there a second? Second number, Representative Landry, all in favor of tabling, and we'll take it up after 1599. All right, it's table. I will close the work session for now on LD 524, and we'll move on to LD 1599, an act to establish a main pesticide sales and use registry. Karen. Um, so section one of the bill uh, requires the board to submit an annual report to ACF, HHS, ENR, and IDEA committees on developments and progress made to carry out the state policy regarding public and private initiatives to minimize reliance on pesticides. Um, that's in Title 22, Section 1471X. Um, section two of the bill establishes the Pesticide Sales and Use Registry, and it directs the Department of ACF, Board of Pesticides Control, in collaboration with DAF's uh, Office of Information Technology to create a publicly accessible online registry of pesticide dealers and applicators reporting pesticides sold, distributed, or applied in the state and including the quantity, location, and purpose of the use of pesticides in indoor and outdoor applications. Um, and section three requires the board to submit a report to those same uh, four committees, ACF, HHS, ENR, and IDEA on um, progress made in developing and administering this online registry and recommendations for ensuring that information from pesticide dealers and applicators is recorded on the registry if a dealer or applicator is unable to access the internet. And it gives the um, authority to all committees singly <laughs> um, to submit bills to the second regular session of the 130th. Um, so Representative Osher does have a proposed amendment to sort of address some of the concerns at the public hearing. I, I did not send it to you because I wasn't sure um, if I should or if I was authorized, but um, I don't know if I, I do have it. I could screen share it. Um, I know sure. Representative Osher provided an amendment to me last night and I uh, tried to clean it up, um, but there might be some few remaining um, questions that need to be answered. Sure, so why don't you screen share that and we'll let Representative Osher talk about it a little bit. Thank you very much. Uh, that's so the good. concerns that were expressed were that uh, having to register in advance of spraying, which I picked up from under the notification of neighbors. That was 
that was I copied from that. But if I take that out, then people don't have to worry about that. I, people are also concerned that their names, if we had a public registry, their names as pesticide applicators would be visible to the public and that that made some of the um, representatives of applicators were saying that that was uncomfortable. So I, the, the changes that I've made that are in this amendment, oh, also, so, uh, so one of the problems with, with um, notifying early on this online registry that was publicly facing would also be that if you notified that you were planning to spray and then the weather changed or something happened, then that would mean many times going back to uh, put the information in. So now it's changed to a week after you've sprayed, then you put the information in also that it's not publicly facing, that it's an online registry. And as uh, uh, Director Patterson mentioned already, people do, th do a lot of the interface with Board of Pesticides Control online, but this, instead of having an annual report, this is requesting that they regularly update. And so, uh, and then this, this provides so I'm reading a note. It allows the rules for the, for the submission of info necessary. I anyway, I, I'm trying to see a note here. Anyway, so um, so that the changes are that's no longer publicly facing, and it, so that makes it a registry that is very is useful. As I said, as, as a scientist and as so a legislator that wants to uh, hear from the pesticides control, border pesticides control, and what we've heard is that it's or difficult to organize information because it comes in and it's not organized in a, in a database. So this is a this registry would be a database so that we could query or they could query and provide us with information when we ask them questions. Uh, but so if you can see uh, what is being shown here by Karen is that under pesticide dealers that, uh, that there was a whole list of what had to be data that had to be included and we've crossed all that out because under the rules, there's already a list of what pesticide dealers and uh, need to provide the board of pesticide control. So we felt that it was redundant to put it in here. And uh, Paul Schlein, who used to work for the board of pesticide control, assisted me in um, making these changes and gave me his thoughts. And if he's present, I think he's present today and would be willing to answer questions. And we'll bring him in here in a minute if we have to, if we get to that point. Um, so Representative Osher, um, I, I know you just went through this, but I mean, there's a lot of strikeouts in gray. And so what is the bottom line now that this basically does in a, in a sentence or two? The bottom line is it's a registry so that dealers, people who are selling pesticides and applicators, people who are applying pesticides are providing information that will go into a database. So the challenge will be that the Board of Pesticide Control needs to create that database, but the technology is there, um, is available. And for example, those of us who ran for office as clean elections candidates, people were, that's a publicly facing database that people were allowed to see who contributed. Um, but there's other places in which there's public, but there's databases that are keeping information uh, that, and that makes it, that, that information easier to query. So that's the, the bottom line. And again, the, the concerns that were expressed in the public hearing was that they didn't like the fact that it was public facing. So I've taken out the part where it's public facing. Another concern was that asking people to one, because it was public facing and I was trying to have it also do the job of letting na alerting neighbors uh, that's why I originally said that they should put the what they were applicators, what they were applying in advance. So I've removed that because it's not public facing, so people don't have to report in advance. They just report after they've applied, uh, and they are reporting the things that they already have to keep track of as applicators. Okay. Thank you, uh, Director Patterson. The commercial applicators keep their records and they submit them to you. Is that correct? So they submit an annual summary report. They don't right. submit their records to us. The summary report of how much okay. of each product they use. 
Yeah, so the records are going to be much more detailed, um, much more akin to what is in the original text of this bill. So they would have, you know, the application site, who their customer was, their exact home location, um, you know, the weather conditions, uh, what the pesticide formulation is, what it contains, how it's tank mixed, a uh, variety of information. Um, okay. And what they submit to us annually is, is a summary. So it's the product name, uh, EPA registration number, uh, how much total product was used and how much area that covered and what site was it was applied to. So for example, um, not to pick on anybody, but if it's a golf course, um, they might say, you know, a thousand pounds of a specific product XYZ and it covered, you know, 10 acres of golf green or something. Um, that's what would be in the annual use report as opposed to here are all of the individual applications that ultimately resulted in that total amount. And private applicators do not have to submit their records, but they're available for your inspection. And this would only cover restricted use products anyway. If I saw her cross out in red, general use was not included. Is that correct, Representative Osher? Or I don't remember. I did see general use products in there. But... Uh, yes, I think we did cut out general use. Okay, so it would just be restricted use products. And, and the idea is if they have to keep these records. Yep. No, I understand. Um, and the last thing that we had to do was which one? You, you had reports from commercial out sales. Um, are those records sent to you at all now, Representative? I mean, Director Patterson? Am I an honorary representative now? No, I demoted you, you actually. So, you hear so much, so. Um, so, so um, no, so with general use pesticide dealers um, that are selling to the end users, including the, the homeowner or, or whomever, sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, no, they do not send us that information. And even for the restricted use pesticide dealers, they're sending us, again, a summary of a total. This is how many, how many of these units uh, we sold, as opposed to, here are each and every one of the sales that we made and to whom it was sold. Okay. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, Karen, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I guess I just want clarification on Representative Osher's amendment because I, it was my understanding that she did want to include licensed general use, limited use, restricted use pesticide dealers. Um, and, and, you know, but we couldn't use just the word pesticide dealer because that's a person who distributes limited or restricted use pesticides. So we need, I guess it was my understanding we needed another term there. So that's um, when I screen shared and I just sent you my version of the amendment that was just cleaned up a little bit. Um, it's in red. So I didn't know if um, in, in chapter 10, uh, the definitions uh, rules, there's a a definition of pesticide distributor, which seems to include um, general use and limited and restricted use pesticide distributors or dealer. I don't know if that's the appropriate use of that term, but anyway, that's a question that I have. Okay. Um, Representative Osh, I don't know if you have an answer for Karen on that, or maybe Director Patterson does. Um, definition of a dealer versus a distributor, but uh, I'll start with Representative Osher. Uh, we, I had this in the discussion. Let me just check my chat here. Uh, so actually, so general use, I take, I stand correct. I correct myself. General use is included in, and, okay. yep. the, and the definition, there is a definition uh, and Karen uh, suggested this to me last night. Uh, so maybe Karen, you could go over this step, the definition you were saying that there's already exists. Yeah, I mean, um, not right on point, but I was looking at the definition of um, pesticide distributor, uh, which is in chapter 10 rules. A uh, person required to be licensed to distribute general, restricted, or limited use pesticides. So I, I don't know if that's the correct term. Um, I guess I may ask Director Patterson if 
Yeah, I think so. I'll, I'll, I can double check. I mean, depending on how this conversation goes, I'm happy to double check and make sure the right language gets in there or gets tweaked if that's something that can be done after the fact to, to best reflect the language and rule. But um, I, I do think there's, well, maybe it's not important to this conversation, but it, you sh maybe should just be aware that there are um, a number of pesticides um, that are exempt from dealer reporting. So I guess, and, and actually from licensure. So um, I guess that's something that's always going to be, you know, unless we start requiring licensure for all of the pesticides sold, um, which is not currently the case in rule. So there are a number of compounds that are used around homes and have a certain percentage active ingredient that's always going to be absent from whatever data is collected. Um, so just something to kind of keep in mind. But yeah, I think the term you found is probably going to be the best way to describe the type of dealership you're trying to focus on, which is everybody who distributes pesticides that has to be licensed. So what do you license distributors? Is there, in my mind, a pesticide distributor and is a pesticide dealer. The pesticide dealer is when I go to the big box store and I buy something off from the retail shelf. To me, the distributor is, oh, this is Dill's distribu distribu distributing company. And I, in turn, send pesticides to all the big box stores in the state of Maine, as well as a whole bunch of different hardware stores, et cetera. So I'm a distributor. Is, is there a distinction in the law someplace between those two? Um, yeah, so so I guess we have, so what you're, what you're kind of describing is maybe the difference between like a retail sale right. to the end, end user versus wholesale. Right. Um, so, so yeah, we, we delineate between those two things. Um, we do require licensure for both. Um, the reporting requirements are different. Um, so if you are simply um, selling to the end user, you don't have to tell us what it is and to whom you sold it. Um, you don't have to keep track of that with regard right. to general use pesticides, restricted use pesticides you do. Um, have to keep track of it at least, and then do an annual summary report for us. Um, for those folks who are um, wholesale distributors, they do have to provide us with a report on what it is they sold um, at the end of year. Um, so as my distributing company sells pesticides to your hardware store, I have to keep that record. But when you sell that to Karen, you don't have to keep a record of that. Exactly. Yep, exactly. Right. So does, Car does Representative OSHA's bill get to that now and says that those people now have to send you that information? And I don't know if that's, a, I think that's a question for Representative OSHA if that's what she's trying to do here. Just so I know, I, I'm just trying to clarify. Uh, I, am I trying to get it? hardware stores to keep the names of the people who they got names sold. but you know that they've sold you know x uh, units of uh, ant spray from such and such company and um you know x amount of weed and feed etc cetera, etc cetera, that they sold off their shelf not to that you that that uh uh, the hardware, Patterson's hardware, so sold it to Karen Netto because then I'm going to keep that information. But I'm asking is that's what this bill does, though, not the name, but Patterson's hardware now would have to report that they sold X number of this and Y number of that. Is that correct? That was my ideal because right. if the goal is to find out how we're doing as a state yep. on the goal of, of reducing the pesticides applied, then this is one way to capture the data that the, each corporation that sells pesticides knows how much they've sold in Maine. But we in Maine don't actually know that information, but we have a way of capturing it, which is to go through a data collection through the Board of Pesticide Control. And the Board of Pesticide Control, my understanding, already is collecting data. Um, it doesn't collect it in a way that makes it easy to query, what to answer our questions or the questions to, to address this big question, which is how are we doing? Are there other questions? Did you want to hear anything, Representative Osher, from uh, Paul Schlein? Did he... Yes, because he was unable to, he had very interesting testimony uh, for the public hearing, but he was unable to attend, so he couldn't ask, answer any questions. Uh, but because he used to work for the Board of Pesticide Control and understands about this kind of database management, uh, and because he worked for the Board of Pesticide Control, he understands 
which parts of the things as Dr. as uh, Director Patterson does, which parts are challenging, which parts already mimic things that the best board pesticides control might be doing. Um, so I just thought he could could answer some uh, some of our questions. Uh, could you read it in um, Paul Schlein, please, um, Cheryl? Yeah, he's there. I guess I just don't. Oh, there he is. All right. Do you have a specific question, Representative Osha? Uh, I I was hoping that he would uh, talk about the the changes we made in this amendment that include taking out the very detailed descriptions of what people have to present and how the um, how the rules already require certain data to be pre pre given to the board of pesticide control. Could you introduce yourself, please, Mr. Schlein? Uh, uh, yes. Um, uh, good morning, senators and representatives um, and committee members. Um, I'm Paul Schlein. I live in the town of Arousic. Uh, I was also the public information officer for the Board of Pesticide Control uh, for eight years, uh, 2005 to 2013. I actually continued uh, for two years after I retired uh, under contract and I did additional work on websites and, and <clears throat> some other things. So 10 years with the Board of Pesticide Control. Um, and from the very beginning, my understanding of this bill, it had a, one single sole purpose and that was to essentially bring back uh, the companion uh, part of the statute, uh, <clears throat> um, statute I'm referring to is the one that uh, is the state policy to reduce reliance on pesticides, uh, 1471X, I believe. Uh, its companion at the time was 1471M, and that was the requirement for reporting. Um, <clears throat> and this bill is intended I believe to go back to that point and uh, with 20 with two, with 1471 M uh, to pick up where it left off in 2002. Um, as <clears throat> my testimony mentioned, and uh, there was a link to the report from the board of pesticides uh, back in 2000 um, that um, show their heroic efforts to, to uh, be accommodating and to uh, actually provide the reports that were required, um, pesticides usage and sales, but for various reasons, uh, um, as stated uh, in the report, and also I mentioned some of those in my testimony, um, they weren't able to do that and they tried. Um, and 2002, uh, the reporting uh, requirement was essentially dropped. The, the part of the statute is still there. So this bill is, intended to bring that back, but with a solution. Um, and that takes into account uh, 24 years of advancement in computers, computer science and database management. And, and um, so um, the, uh, the idea is to essentially take what was uh, and what is um, referring to the existing rules um, in, that the board has and also in, in statute that do require reporting uh, from pesticide applicators and, and all dealers and distributors, um, general use, uh, yes, and also restricted and limited, limited use pesticides. But the idea is to gather all of that information that's now presently already being asked for, uh, whether it's uh, in a daily uh, log or a, an annual report or um, different uh, periods of frequency um, and, and convert that from what's essentially an analog form, something on paper, and, and put that into a digital format where it's more easily entered and more easily analyzed um, and which should make everyone's job easier. It's not adding any new the amendment clarifies all of that at this point, and it really does distill it down to the essence of, of the bill. Um, so, uh, Senate, uh, Representative Osher touched on the minimizing reliance, and but that really is the sole purpose: is to go back and provide specific data, and 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 to determine one way or the other whether the state is actually reducing 
reliance on pesticides. I, I just, I'll just add that, um, and you can tell me that this isn't germane to the, to, to the discussion, but the reason I went to work for the Board of Pesticide Control, um, you know, in, in, in uh, getting ready for an interview, I remember reading, you know, ex extensively about the board and learning about what they did. And what I saw was that exact statute to reduce reliance on pesticides. And the board's, um, the board's motto, uh, think first, spray last. I, I just thought those were two very remarkable things and very admirable for the state of Maine to, to actually you know, be promoting that. And I worked for 10 years, probably most of my time, uh, certainly a large majority of it was actually on, on programs and things that were all directed towards doing that exact thing. Uh, the yardscaping partnership, the gut pass website, you know, lots of outreach and, and conferences and, and all of those things <clears throat> were to, to directed in that. Uh, in the, the yardscaping gardens at Back Cove, major projects. Um, all of those things were directed to that 1471X. And but however, and we talked about this amongst ourselves and the staff there, and and the, the public was inquiring, you know, where do we stand with that? What you how do we know? You know, what's going on? <clears throat> and the only thing that was that actually happened in the last 24 years that I know of, and maybe there's some other uh, minor attempts, was a concerted effort to try to put data together and what was available, and that was the resulting uh, resulted in that uh, the. Uh, graph that I put in my testimony that was at one point on the website for the Board of Pesticide Control, the yardscaping website. And that very dramatically showed that this, that, you know, how specific it was and whether it was based on, you know, how it was, there wasn't any doubt in, you know, that pesticide usage based on sales and distribution was increasing a tremendous amount. So with that in mind, how can, the state and the Board of Pesticide and the ACF not you know, want to basically take advantage of you know, modern technology now and not really add anything to the burden of uh, pesticide applicators and the, the, the community and distributors and not really jump at that opportunity, to be perfectly honest, and, and so, set that in motion. So um, how will this make record keeping and reporting easy for dealers and applicators? Well. It's, they really only have to, well okay there's two two ways that, that it could be done and the first is to have a database through most likely the portal that already exists um, with a form that they go in which which probably matches the forms that they use on paper right now or could certainly even mimic that actually they could actually look like the same thing online and they're just going to be entering digitally the information that they're doing now instead of writing it down on paper uh, and it's you know it, it's in, and then. Um, okay, so then how would this help the Board of Pesticides Control conduct research and provide analysis for bills like the ones we've taken up? There's other bills we've talked about today that are about applications. How would this help with that? That provides a, a very concrete, um, uh, accessible database of all that information, which can be manipulated in any number of ways as databases can. Um, I mean, queried, so you could you could ask, you could ask to gather that data quickly because you don't have to go through paper. Absolutely, there's no data entry, additional data entry required, which is the way it was done 24 years ago, and that was a monumental task. No duplication of efforts, um, readily accessible, and it would and it would, and it could be in real time. I could see that as have being a tremendous tool, even for the board itself, aside from the from the, you know, complying with the statute, uh, you know, for their own research and, you know, and, and looking and not waiting a year for things. They can look at it uh, in real time or certainly, you know, with a delay of a week or so, but it'll be available uh, to, um, to look at. Thank you. Are there, other, are there other questions for Mr. Schlein? Thank you. So I'd go back to Director Patterson. One last question from me. So um, I heard you say that perhaps, if I heard you correctly, there'd be a lot of other information in here that would be on that, uh, you know, like if it was from commercial logs, that would be, you know, if they sprayed it on my property, my name and address would be there too. And um, So is that correct? 
So of with the original version, yes, that's certainly true that, I mean, with regard to comparing this, what's being asked for in this bill versus what we actually are collecting and act actively collecting. So we only right. actively collect the end of year use reports um, and we don't collect those for private applicators. So this is an extension beyond that um, for sure. All right, thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Ready for a motion? Uh, well, but private applicators have to keep these same logs. Is that true? They do not have to submit them to us. They only have to provide them as part of inspection. Right, but they but they do keep them. Um, so anybody who is applying pesticides as a part of production of an agricultural commodity on their own property or as a commercial applicator who's providing services to the public or as a government employee, um, they do have to keep pesticide application logs, yes. Great, thank you. Representative Underwood. I'd like to make a motion ought not to pass, please. Ought not to pass, is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by Senator Black. Any further discussion? Representative O'Neill. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to hear from um, folks who made the motion, um, what they're opposed to in it. I think just something I've heard in the many years on this committee is that, um, is that, sorry, I'm just laughing. I was seeing Representative Schofield, um, <laughs> is that we lack information in a central place. And um, in my mind, I just think it makes sense to transition in 2021 to, um, but you can place, central place so that in this place, you can have this information database about. that gives information of central. Sorry, I was muting that person. Um, but that's about it. It just it seems straightforward. It provides the public with information and um, gives the board and, and academics and people like that um, potential information to work with. Anybody want to respond to her question? The one thing that I can see um, as a potential problem is, um, I, I, I think just a year end, um, you know, information that they have is fine. Uh, commercial applicators already do that. Private applicators, um, you know, if they're, I mean, by law, they're gonna have to do this. Now, all the retailers are going to have to do this. It's going to be added cost for a lot of people that won't show in as a physical note here. But I think it, even though I realize, I hear what you're saying about uh, <clears throat> electronic information and submitting it, and uh, then it's got to be received by the board and um, sorted out. So, um, but anyway, Senator Black. Yes, I, I just think it's uh, a lot of added burden and... Uh, uh, duplication, um, uh, the hardware stores and distributors, everybody are keeping track of the records now, and I think it's doing a good job, and uh, I don't see any need of uh, putting more regulations on them. Representative Underwood. Government that uh, governs the least governs the best. This is one of my primary mottos of my life. And it's true then, it's been true all, all over my life, all my life, and it's true today. So, uh, and I agree with what both people have said initially regarding over-regulation. Um, vote ought not to pass. Thank you. Any other comments? Cheryl, would you please call the roll? LD 1599 ought not to pass. So if you vote yes, you're voting for ought not to pass. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. No. Senator Chloe Maxman. No. Representative Maggie O'Neill. No. Representative Maggie O'Neill, no. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, yes. Representative Lori Osher. No. Representative Lori Osher, no. Representative Joseph Underwood. Yes. 
Representative Joseph Underwood, yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. No. Representative Bill Pluker, no. Representative Jeffrey Gifford. Yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, yes. Representative David McRae. No. Representative David McRae, no. Representative Susan Bernard. Yes. Representative Susan Bernard, yes. Eight yes, five no. Minority report. Um, um, not to pass as amended as described by the sponsor. So on that front, um, I will work with um, Director Patterson on the precise term we should use. Um, I'm thinking it might be pesticide dealer. Um, I'm, I'm kind of looking to you, Representative Osher, since it was your amendment. Um, and then also, I know you wanted to refer to chapter 50 rule, but we can't do that in statute as the chapter number is somewhat arbitrary. So I could include language, you know, you refer to this section, statutory section, but um, I could also refer to as required by the board by rule in uh, those two places that, that um, chapter 50 was, was mentioned. Thank you. Okay. All right, we'll close the work session on uh, LD 1599 and we'll go back to LD 524. If I can have a motion to take it off the table, please. Been uh, moved by Representative Landry, seconded by Representative O'Neill. So, Karen, take us back to where we were. Uh, um, I'm not sure where we were, to be honest. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, we, some committee members wanted to sort of see where the discussion went with LD 1599 um, to, to sort of inform the end of the discussion on uh, 524. So uh, there are some options to, to sounds like uh, could go with the original bill. Um, the department had some clarifying type uh, suggested amendments. Um, there's also the idea of um, from the sponsor and the department turning the act into a resolve to sort of um, direct the department to come back with the best methods to accomplish, um, you know, the information being more publicly available. Um, of course, this is uh, school uh, pesticide logs. So, I guess that's where we are. And I think as I mentioned, uh, I like the idea of resolve, asking them to come back um, on record keeping. And um, I think I'd like to see two sections on that. The first section would be, you know, with school logs um, and a, a way to get at that. And the second one would be back to um, <clears throat> how we can look at other ways of getting records to the Board of Pesticides Control um, from the standpoint of um, getting information on use in the state of Maine. Um, I don't know if that would be an annual thing. Uh, I would leave it up to the board to look at, but I agree with uh, the intent of 1599, but I think uh, that we were going uh, down the road of too much information being collected. Um, and I, I think, it, as I mentioned, the, the reason why I wasn't for it was I think it was a burden on storekeepers as well as um, other folks, the private applicators, et cetera, to get that information in. So I'd like to see the board um, see if there's a way of getting at use records um, that uh, at least on an annual basis. So if they could look into both of those things, uh, that would be the way I would like to see this bill go, but that's just me, just throw it out there for discussion. Other thoughts from anyone? Anybody want Representative Schofield? 
I kind of I kind of go along with that, Senator Dill. Uh, I think a resolve uh, asking the department to answer the questions that you just articulated a few moments ago, the numbers, the quantity, the overall impact, the overall look of things on an annual basis, I think would be a, a, a good way to begin. And if going forward over the coming years, we find that's not adequate, well, the legislature in those days finds it less, less than adequate, they can deal with it. But I think that would be a good start. So I would make a motion that we turn it into a resolve uh, with those things that I just mentioned in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Hall. So what I'm kind of hearing is that we would ask the board to look into the best methods of collecting this information um, as we go forward and in kind of two different areas, the, the, the school records, as well as, you know, sales and use records of uh, private applicators, um, as well as commercial applicators and somehow sales records, but what is best for them on how to collect that information and make it available in a searchable database. So we're not asking them to necessarily have it available, but work at it and report back to us next year on what might be able to go forward. Is that right, Representative Schofield? What yes, their suggestions on how, yes, yep. on their suggestions on how they might be able to move this forward so to, to provide the information that we are searching for. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Representative McCray. Yes, just a quick one. Uh, I, I was concerned about the report back then. I heard the word report back. Do we have a date specific on that? Uh, we have. Should we? Yeah, we probably should. Um, I, it's the short session, so I'm going to say probably what early January, January first, or. Yeah, that's what I was going to suggest. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Representative O'Neill. Um, I am open to considering this if we would have um, a bill, like an ability to report out a bill and act on it. Because I think what we're doing, we could have done during the public hearing process, frankly. Um, so I'm, I am frustrated that we've been talking about this for so many years um, because it's really the people of Maine who are hurt by not doing this right away. Um, so my requirement for voting for this would be that we have a bill and, and we're willing to act on what the board comes back and says because we're not going to vote for something just to make people have cover so that they're not um so they're avoiding the first vote that we just took sure i mean i don't have a problem with you know we have the ability to report out a bill like we do in most of our resolves anyway representative schofield it's your bill is that suitable with you uh, I think I'd rather have it be a resolve. I think no, it is a resolve, but it oh, just okay. gives us the ability if we want to, after we get their information, if, if we want to put in a bill, we can. Yes, thank you. I understand now, thank you. Right. All right, any further discussion? Seeing none, um, Cheryl, would you call the roll please? I will. LD 524 ought to pass as amended. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Tom Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Representative Joseph Underwood. You muted, Representative. 
Representative Joseph Underwood. Yeah, uh, no, it's not needed. Representative Joseph Underwood, no. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford. Yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, yes. Representative David McRae. Yes. Representative <clears throat> David McRae, yes. Representative Susan Bernard. Yes. Representative Susan Bernard, yes. 12 yes, one, is it ought not to pass? Representative Underwood? Yes, ought not to pass is correct. Thank you. On LD 524, an act to require schools to submit pest management activity logs to the Board of Pesticides Control and posting of inspection results for the purpose of providing information to the public. It's ought to pass as amended, 1210. Representative Schofield, do you have a question on this? Is your hand just still up? Okay. I will close the hearing. Uh, I mean, the public, uh, the, yeah, the work session on LD 524. And um, that leaves us now back to Representative O'Neill and LD um, 808. Oh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Am I taking over? All right, give me a second. I might have to run because I'm waiting for a, um, a notice about a public hearing. Actually, with um, Representative Bernard's other committee. All right, so I'm going to open up the work session on LD 808, um, like Senator Dill said. And Karen, I'd ask you to give us an overview of the bill, please. Sure, thank you, Representative. Uh, so LD808 is an act to clarify the funding for the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Diagnostic and Research Laboratory. Um, this bill is a concept draft and um, the summary says it proposes to amend the laws governing the fee imposed on the retail sale in the state of containers of pesticide products and the use of that fee to fund the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Diagnostic and Research Lab. Um, so as you all know, um, Public Law 2019 Chapter 548 went into effect last June, and we did hear testimony um, from folks that implementation of the pesticide container fee uh, has been problematic um, for re retailers. So um, the so th there were um, proponents of the bill include the Maine Grocers and Food Pro Producers Association and the Retail Association of Maine. Um, no one is opposed uh, to LD 808. And we did hear testimony neither for nor against uh, from the Board of Pesticides Control and Maine Revenue Services. Um, I do know that Senator Farron, the sponsor of this bill, has a proposed amendment. Um, and there were requests that uh, Christine Cummings from Maine Grocers and Food Producers Association, as well as Curtis Picard from the Retail Association of Maine be present to answer questions at the work session, as well as someone from Maine Revenue Services. Um, so there are folks here to, to ask questions about that. Um, I could go over Senator Farron's amendment or you can have him um, go over it. I don't know if he's in the attendees. It would be helpful to have an overview. I'm going to look at attendees. He is not here. He was okay. here earlier today, but he's not here now. Okay. okay. Um, so I'll just share, share my screen if that's okay. Please. I did send it to you all, but, um, and it is posted on the web, uh, on the committee's webpage. So um, basically it amends, it strikes everything. Um, well, there is nothing there. So it would um, amend the provision on uh, registered uh, pesticides. So let me just uh, grab my copy here. Uh, 
Okay, so this section one of the bill, um, the amendment would require the list of currently registered pesticide products generated and maintained by the board um, also include the corresponding universal product codes for each product. And then the amendment also provides that uh, beginning January 1st, 2022, uh, the board shall require universal products co codes for all registered uh, pesticides sold in the state. And then section two of the bill uh, requires the board to submit a report no later than January 15 of each year to this committee on the use of tick laboratory and pest management fund monies. Then section three of the bill um, provides that the pesticide <clears throat> container fee be reduced from 15 cents to 12 cents um, and also provides that the fee be collected by suppliers rather than uh, at the point of sale by retailers. Uh, which is why the fee is reduced by three cents. Um, so it'd be, it would be collected by suppliers, including distributors, vendors, wholesalers, and brokers for internet and mail order sales to retailers and direct sales to consumers. And then finally, it adds to the list of exemptions um, a restricted use pesticide. Um, so I did have some questions. Um, I don't know if paragraphs A and B under exemptions are necessarily needed anymore. Um, if it's no longer um, a fee um, imposed by retailers. And then um, I think the intent of the new paragraph D would be that it would include um, any pesticide or pesticide use classified for restricted use, um, including limited use. So it would include, you know, um, restricted use pesticides that are automatically restricted um, because the determination has been made by the US EPA. And then there's uh, restricted use pesticides that the state determines by rule are restricted use pesticides. And then there's a subset that's my understanding of limited use uh, pesticides uh, as determined by the state. So I believe the intent of that paragraph it, is that it includes all of those categories. So that's Senator Farron's amendment with, you know, we have a few outstanding questions, clarifications, and he, it's my understanding he would defer to the committee on those. Thanks, Karen. Um, so just no other hands up, but I had a question about, okay, so that restricted use piece doesn't apply anymore because it's not retailers handling it, correct? Uh, are you talking about the exemptions yeah. under section four of the amendment? Yes, or is it exempt? I thought it was removing an exemption, but it, is it creating an exemption? It's creating an exemption and uh, that new paragraph D Okay. Yeah, I'd be curious about the thought process on that. I see a question from Representative Booker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so Karen, this is, this fee is going to be collected by suppliers or distributors, vendors, wholesalers, and brokers. So what it, does that mean? What does that mean? Um, I'm not sure to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess, um, I, the idea that was discussed at the public hearing is that um, it would be assessed on the distributors, but um, that was the language that he proposed. So I wasn't privy to the conversations that he's had. I mean, perhaps Christine Cummings or Curtis Picard, um, I see them in the attendees um, might be able to answer that question. Is it your reading of this, Karen, that this is only going to be a a uh, fee that's assessed on internet and mail order sales from that last sentence of section three, paragraph one. Yeah, I see what you mean. I'm not sure that that's the intent. 
Okay. Yeah. And it may be yeah. including, but not limited to. Is Senator Farron here or, or whoever helped him with this? I'd, I'd love to hear about the intent. I'm not, I'm unclear with what the intent is with a couple of these. Also with the restricted use pesticide, I'm not sure what the, what the intent on that one is either. I can, I can try to find you. In the meantime, I see um, Senator Black. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not sure, but I'm wondering if that wasn't to take the burden off of my retail stores and just put it um, uh, back on the large, you know, the, the uh, bulk distributors. Um, and I don't think it was ever intended to be on restricted use uh, back along. I don't, I don't think it was on restricted use uh, before, but I might be wrong in that. Thank you. I think you're, I mean, you're right that if it was sold at a retail road, location that restricted use wouldn't have fallen under that, right? But I just wonder if it's fair to, to separate it out. Um, so if you're a regular Joe person, you end up paying that fee at retail price probably, but, um, but you don't if you're an applicator. And so that's part of why I just shared um, Representative Booker's question about it. Why distinguish, I guess. Oh, Representative Booker. Sorry, I Thank forgot you. this. <laughs> <laughs> and just to clarify also that uh, organic farmers don't use restricted use pesticides, so it still apply to all organic farmers. Okay. Thank you. Um, is the sponsor here? I'm calling him now. Okay. <laughs> Madam Chair? Yes. Perfect. Would it be appropriate to table this and, and bring it back for conversation after? Um, I think if folks want, is there anybody that has been a stakeholder that has been part of these conversations that wants to put their hand up that's talked with the sponsor and agreed with the sponsor on this language? Uh, you know, I don't know if Christine Cummings and Curtis Picard um, or even main revenue services have been part of those conversations, but I see all three. Oh, <laughs> Curtis Picard raised his hand. Thank you. Uh, Representative Black, real quickly first. Can, can we um, ask them to comment on this amended version? Uh, Absolutely. The, yeah. um, so who would you like to hear from first, Mr. Picard? That, that would be fine. I, and I don't know if, excuse me, uh, Representative, I don't know if Director Patterson has also been um, privy to these conversations as well. Director Patterson, have you um, worked with the sponsor on this amendment? Not, no, not this amendment, but thank you for asking. Okay. All right, can we please bring in the folks? I'm sorry, I was on the phone. Who would you like to see, Representative O'Neill? Chris Picard, please. Yes, I'm right. sorry. I see Christine Cummings has her hand up as well. If you would you like to. her as well? Yep. All right. All right, uh, Mr. Picard, thanks for being here. So, can you um, let us know what your conversations with the sponsor have been about this? Uh, sure, Representative O'Neill and members of the committee. I am Curtis Picard, President CEO of the Retail Association of Maine for the record. Um, this is the first we've seen the amendment. Uh, we saw it this morning, um, but I will tell you, and we uh, shared this in our public testimony as well, we um, conducted a number of stakeholder meetings over the last year on this issue. And the idea of shifting the fee to the distributor level also posed a number of challenges as well. Um, I know Christine has a member from AG of New England um, who was part of those stakeholder groups. I don't know if he is available. He can talk more 
directly about it, but one of the things I can bring uh, for consideration is, especially with large retailers, uh, their distribution centers aren't always located in Maine. So while they may be taking these products at, say, a New Hampshire warehouse, they're not really going to be able to segregate which of those products are coming to Maine versus other states, which is why it's still going to be a challenge to track and collect a fee if it gets shifted to the distributor or wholesale level. Um, so we know this is a challenge, um, you know, and that's why we brought this bill forward is it's not working for, for collection at retail. We know there's challenge at the distributor level. If there was an easy answer to this, we certainly would have brought it forward. Um, I know there's been talks with the administration about doing some sort of funding for this in the next change package. I don't know what the status of those conversations are currently, but I know that was an avenue that was being explored as well. All right, thank you. And uh, Ms. Cummings, do you have anything to add to, to that? Good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to reiterate some of the points uh, both Mr. Picard and I have been working on this. And I do have uh, a few members here as a part of the discussion as well who could speak to the complexities and their exercise working through the pilot program over the last year trying to implement this. And I think hearing firsthand from them may be important to understand that even though this would be taking the burden off a of retail, it would simply be shifting the complexities from one to another. And so if you would like to indulge them or learn more, they're certainly available. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, something I'd like to hear first is some information from MRS. If we could bring in the representative of MRS to talk about how a tax on a distributor or wholesaler would work. And who is that? It's Elena Patterson. No. Right, oh, wait. It's yeah, she's there. She's yeah. been there the whole time. Somebody just moved her. She's not okay. there now. <laughs> got it. I was spelling it with an E, not an A. <laughs> Hi, Ms. Patterson. Um, thanks for being here. I'm wondering if maybe she was kind of listening as other bills passed. So she's not in front of her computer. All right. Um, oh, hi. I'm new to this. Hi, my name is Elena Patterson. I am a tax policy analyst in the sales fuel and special tax division of Maine Revenue Services. Hi, thanks for being here. Could you comment on um, the difficulty, you know, implementation of a wholesaler or um, retailer fee? Seems to me like it's doable and it's something we've talked about before, but, or I have, I had a bill like that last time. So. Um, there are, the way that the language is currently written in our Title 36, which is the, um, if you're looking at the sponsored amendment, is that Section 4941. Um, the amendment does not touch subsection three, which details that the administration of the pesticide container fee is to be administered in the same manner as the sales tax. And sales tax is a levy on the consumer, but it is imposed on the retailer. So we have had, um, and I apologize because this is also for me the first time I'm seeing this amendment, so I don't have as full a scope on it as I would like. Um, we have had a motor vehicle oil premium fee that was imposed that created a registration requirement. Um, it, what it would need to do, I think, at first glance, is we may need to look at the registration requirements under Title 36, Part 3, to determine that these distributors, vendors, wholesalers, et cetera, do still have a registration requirement that would need to have them register. So for instance, um, a distributor that might be operating outside of, New of Maine, for instance, um, what Mr. Picard referenced, a warehouse in New Hampshire that then distributes products to many different states, um, they may not have what's known as nexus with the state of Maine to require them to register as a retailer. So I would need to do that type of analysis on the language to see if those suppliers would still qualify as a retailer. But that's really where I think the question comes. Um, again, if this fee is to be imposed as a sales tax, sales tax is imposed 
on the retailer. It's technically, it's on the ultimate consumer. So it's on you when you purchase one of these items that is then the responsibility of the retailer to collect it. So shifting the collection of the fee from the retailer to the supplier or the distributor does pose some problems. If I think the administration provision under that section 4941 is not also updated. Okay, thanks. So if I understand correctly, um, and I'm not sure what language you're referring to, so I'm just gonna speak yeah. what I've heard. Um, sure. So you're saying it's different than a sales tax. Mm -hmm. um, I think this would be like an excise tax or a fee, like it's a back end kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, generally it's speaking. That you can you definitely have nexus for if a business is reaching into Maine to, to distribute products, correct? Potentially. So there is something known as a remote seller. Um, under the sales tax law, a remote seller is someone who may not be physically located in the state of Maine, but does make sales of products delivered into the state of Maine. In order to require registration as a remote seller under our laws, they need to have at least $100,000 of gross sales or 200 transactions of tangible personal property or taxable services delivered into the state in the prior calendar year or the current calendar year in order to require registration as a retailer in the state of Maine. So there is a possibility that these distributors, vendors, et cetera, do qualify as a remote seller. So that physical nexus requirement may not be met, but the remote seller is. There's also a possibility, if we're talking about a small distributor, um, that they wouldn't meet that threshold, and therefore they would not be required to register. To That's the piece that I really need to look at, is if they're not required to register under that, is there enough transactions of the pesticide fee potentially to require registration? I don't have an answer for that yet. I'd have to look at the language a little bit in more detail. Okay, thanks, that would be helpful. And, and just to clarify, for myself, I'm hearing the word retailer when we're talking about distributor, distributors, and I'm just confused. I'm sure it's a definitional thing, but could you help me understand? Are we able to make a distinction or do we have to fall under that remote retailer definition that you're talking about? So in the sales tax law, there is a definition for retailer and it is anybody who makes a sale, anyone who is registered with the state of Maine for the collection and remittance of sales tax. Essentially, anybody who makes sales of tangible personal property or taxable services and meets the registration requirements outlined in another section of our title is required to register. And the term that we are giving them is a retailer. So you could have somebody who you would think is a manufacturer, but by dint of the fact that they are making sales of tangible personal property or taxable services into the state of Maine, they would fall under the definition of retailer under our title. Okay. I think I, I just have more questions about what does the supply chain look like? Are we properly classifying people as retailers? I, I suppose I'm, I'm just a little fuzzy on that, but. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's our definitional title and it comes to, it, it doesn't take supply chain concerns. It's just how we recognize who is registered with the state of Maine to collect and collect the sales tax. If taxes do, you know, a, the manufacturer example that I gave are most likely making sales for resale, which is not a taxable sale. So sales tax is not collected on that transaction to the retailer, but under our law, they are still registered as a retailer, even though they may not make a single taxable sale. Okay. Um, Senator Farron, do you have, thank you very much. Do you have anything to add to this? Would you be willing to, to connect with MRS about this to um, talk about details or I guess first welcome and, and do you want to tell us anything about the process with the amendment too? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, this, this is one of those ones I still go back and I think uh, Mr. Picard and, and, and some others will say, you know, we, we identified this as being a, a pretty significant impact on, on some of our sales uh, on the retail side of this and trying to do this, this change to the distributor or supplier seemed, uh, 
it's easier than it sounds like it is right now. So the answer, the short answer to your question is yes, absolutely. Um, be interested to see what, what the options are and trying to work that through. I know the committee's trying to move things along as we all are in, in our respective committees, but uh, if you could give us a couple days or, or, or whatever to continue to work on this would be much appreciated. I think we could do that. Does the committee have any further questions? Um, so would folks be willing to table this and give the sponsor and, and MRS and stakeholders a couple days to discuss? Representative Landry, is that a motion and a second from uh, Rep Black? All right, um, just a hands. All right, thanks. That's tabled and thank you all. Thank you, folks. Oops, I muted myself. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda. Karen, I'm having trouble finding my calendar to find the number. I have too many things. Uh, 1594. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so right, I want to open the work session on that and then ask you to say the title and describe it, please. Okay. Oh, did you open the work session? Do you want me to go ahead? Or? Oh yeah, that was it. I oh, just okay. The words I had to say. Yeah. Um, yeah um, so this is an act to suspend the collection of the container fee for hand sanitizer and sanitizing wipes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the committee may want to table this one as well, but I can given that we don't really know what's gonna happen with 808 at this point, but I can go ahead and do the overview and you can take it from there. So um, there was no testimony in favor other than the sponsor. And uh, since putting in the bill, she did uh, come to understand that, um, that uh, hand sanitizers and wipes designed for hands are not, um, classified as a pesticide. However, she did say she wasn't clear that this is 100% clear to all retailers. And um, she did indicate um, that uh, some retailers may be Im imposing the fee. But um, her intent, I guess, at the public hearing was that it would apply to surface sanitizing wipes um, that are technically classified as uh, pesticides by the board. And um, it seems like a bad time to begin imposing a fee on these particular products during a pandemic. So uh, she just suggested an amendment to reflect this correct designation of surface sanitizing wipes as pesticides um, and to create a moratorium on the fee until the pandemic is uh, over. And then another suggestion uh, Representative Tepler had um, was to ask um, to instruct the department to work with retailers to better inform them uh, of the items on which the pesticide container fee is imposed. So there was no testimony in opposition. Um, the department uh, and main revenue services in writing only, um, but the department of ACF was at the public hearing um, and they did talk about, you know, the definition of a, a pesticide, um, that consumer products that are used to sanitize um, the human body are not pesticides, but are regulated as medicines. Therefore, hand sanitizer and sanitize, hand sanitizing wipes are not pesticides, but are instead considered drugs that are regulated by the FDA, and they're not subject to the fee. Um, Surface sprays and wipes used to sanitize or disinfect inanimate objects are considered pesticides and are subject to the fee. Although we did hear from the sponsor of the bill, there may be some confusion on that. So um, I think it was main revenue services in their written testimony pointed out as currently drafted, there is an emergency preamble on this bill. So retailers would be required to conform with the proposed suspension immediately upon enactment. 
um, and they may not have time to update their required systems and update other information on such short notice. So Maine Revenue Services did recommend an amendment to maybe um, include, you know, delay the applica application date by at least 10 business days following the bill's effective date to give retailers adequate time to make the appropriate changes. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Karen. Um, does anybody have questions for Karen? All right, seeing none, I see the sponsor here and I wanna um, welcome Representative Tepler um, if she'd like to add anything on the process she's gone through. Thank you, Chair O'Neill. Um, I am concerned about uh, whether or not uh, the message is passing clearly to retailers about what is and what isn't on the um, pesticide list. And uh, it sounds to me like this committee is still refining and defining that to begin with. So that is a problem for the fee being imposed. Um, perhaps you want to consider an overall uh, halt to the fee until you determine what it's appropriately imposed on, uh, but that's not my business. <laughs> um, in terms of this bill, I am very open to MRS's suggestion that, that retailers be allowed 10 days to realign their cash registers um, and uh, hold off on the 15 cent fee per container on wipes, uh, sanitizing wipes for surfaces. Um, but I do think this is not a good time to be charging an additional 15 cent fee on sanitizing wipes. Uh, people really do feel more comfortable wiping down surfaces, doorknobs, uh, shared spaces, um, certainly in any public space, surface wiping is happening on a regular basis. So I, th I think it's important to consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tepler. Um, all right, so do I see any questions? I'm, I'm wondering um, where the committee is, if folks wanna move along with this, and then if there is some harmonizing to do, we can, um, we can do that when we get um, Senator Farron's bill, um, but uh, Senator Black. I think it would be prudent for us to um, table this at this time and take up 808 first and, and, and then we would know where we're at. There's a possibility that things are gonna change. And, and as we've also heard that uh, uh, there might be a possibility of, uh, of general fund funding for this instead of you know the, the fees altogether. So. I, I think we ought to, uh, my suggestion would be, that we would, um, I don't know what the rest of the committee feels, but I would, I would think we might want to consider uh, wait until after we do 808. Okay. I think, um, thank you, Senator Black. I think that works for me for the reason that they're going to come back probably by Thursday anyhow. So I think we could quickly take a vote on this before we have session to make sure that folks get this exemption. Um, but we have a few days anyway. So um, does that work okay with everybody? All right, can I get a motion to table the bill? And thank you, Representative Tipler. All right, motion by Hall, seconded by McCray. Hands. All right, thank you very much. All right, so we'll take that back up Thursday. Thank you, committee. I'll see you later. All right, so let's look at where we are on the list. I'm sorry, I gotta pull it up. Right now would be the 1611, which is the harness racing bill. Thank you. All right, I move that we open work session on that. And um, Karen, could you please give a description of that bill? Sure. Um, so, Sections one and two um, make changes to the definition of commercial track. And to be honest with you, it looks like they've just taken some provisions of current law 
and put it into the the, the definition under um, 275A subsection one. So um, right now, uh, a commercial track means any harness horse racing track that is a for-profit business uh, and is licensed to conduct harness horse racing with paramutual wagering that is not associated with an agricultural fair. And that if the population of the region is 300,000 or more um, and conducted racing on more than 69 days in uh, each calendar year. And what this bill adds or actually moves from other provisions in current law, it says, unless a lesser number of days of racing was conducted in a year due to conditions beyond the control of the racetrack owner or operator as approved by the commission or a determination by the commission and with the express written approval of the track and of a statewide association of horsemen that a lesser number of race days is in the best interests of the state harness horse racing industry. So those really aren't new ideas in the statute. They've just sort of been moved into the definition. And then um, they make a similar change to if the population of the region is less than 300,000 um, conducted racing on more than 34 days, it adds, um, those two paragraphs to the definition. So section three um, is new. It, um, so section in, in the law, uh, 275B, sale of paramutual pools. Um, it says the following persons may sell paramutual pools on horse racing in accordance with this chapter and rules adopted by the commission. So currently there are racetracks and off-track betting facilities. And what this bill proposes to do in section three is add uh, facilities approved by the commission. So this would be a commercial track, um, you know, that's licensed to conduct harness racing with paramutual betting. Uh, may sell paramutual pools and common paramutual pools for simulcast races at a facility that is approved by the commission and located uh, within 25 miles of the racetrack where the licensed race or race meet is conducted and a municipality with a population uh, greater than 55,000. So, um, so for proponents, we had, and section four is just technical uh, change that, that puts in a cross-reference. Uh, so the proponents of the bill were the Maine State Harness Racing Commission, First Tracks Investment LLC, uh, Maine Harness Horsemen's Racing Association, and um, opponents include Scarborough Downs, who testified at the hearing, and we got written testimony from uh, Winner's Circle Off-Track Betting Facility of Lewiston, and there was no testimony neither for nor against. And I will leave it at that for now. Thank you, Karen. Um, I wanna see if Mr. Jennings is here from the department, or any questions for Karen, I'm sorry. No. Um, could we please bring Mr. Jennings in? Yep. Taking him a while. Where is he? There he is. Out of the black hole. Welcome, Mr. Jennings. Um, thanks for being here. Um, I would love for you to please introduce yourself and um, and my question for you is if you can walk through what the typical process is to um, to get this offsite betting. I'm going to get the acronym wrong, but what the typical process is to, to gain access to this and what this bill changes. Um, thank you, Representative O'Neill. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, my name is Henry Jennings and I'm the executive director for the Maine State Harness Racing Commission. It sounds like your specific question is about the, the second part of the bill um, relating to um, the so-called simulcast provisions um, and off-track betting facilities. So I'll attempt to clarify that, clarify that for you. Um, 
there are two ways to conduct wagers or on um, harness racing that occurs at, at um, remote tracks or tracks that are, are not um, where the racing is occurring. And, and that can happen at a commercial track where um, when you get a commercial track license from the commission, you automatically get authorization to conduct what's called simulcasting, um, which is the ability to watch racing at other tracks on televisions and place wagers on those um, races. Um, that must be essentially at, at the location where you conduct racing, or it could be at a slot machine facility associated with the track, which, is, which really is what goes on at Bangor. The other way to um, bet on harness racing or horse racing in general at um, locations separate from where you are is through an off-track betting facility. And in order to get that kind of a license, um, there's a fairly elaborate process which requires munis municipal approval and, um, uh, and sign-offs from the from the other licensed entities if um, they are within certain, um, I guess, distances from where you propose to have your facility. So, so there's two different ways to do it. Um, it's spelled out in 275D of, of Title Eight for the off-track betting facilities. And um, it's, I think it's in 271 of Title Eight for the commercial tracks. Um, this amendment proposes to allow a commercial track um, to have their simulcast facility at essentially a separate location than the track itself. And, and that's already allowed um, in the case of a commercial track that, that is associated with a company with slot machines. So that's already happening in Bangor, um, but this would be, um, something, there's only two commercial tracks in the state of Maine. There's Bangor Historical Track and there's, um, right now there's First Tracks Cumberland, which is um, racing at Cumberland Fairgrounds in an interim um, condition, if you will. So um, it would, I, I presume the, that the intent would be to allow First, track, Cum, First Tracks Cumberland to host their simulcast um, at a different location that, than at Cumberland Fairgrounds. Thank you. So as a follow-up, um, just to see that I'm following. So the track, can you explain again what this is going to separate when you mentioned Cumberland? So <laughs> this law is to make an exemption to the typical rule for one particular it, person. I'm trying to understand what that situation is, if you could describe it. Well, I don't, you know, it, it certainly doesn't doesn't specify any particular, um, you know, one beneficiary of the of the uh, proposed amendment. But um, so, first tracks um, is racing at Cumberland Fairgrounds, and um, that's a difficult location for them to host simulcast racing. Um, just because it's kind of removed from the population, if you will. And, and so um, they're just looking for some other, I believe, that the idea is to be able to hold their simulcast, which, which as I understand, is about two thirds of the total revenue of a commercial track, um, be able to hold that simulcast operation in a municipality that's within 25 miles of the Cumberland Fairgrounds and has a population greater than 55,000. I'm told that uh, points towards Portland. I haven't actually researched the mileage or the population of the various communities within 25 miles of, of Cumberland Fairgrounds, but. Um, okay, thank you. So can you describe more what a simulcast is? So it sounds like the the racing track would stay separated over in Cumberland, and then there would be just a separate gambling facility. Yeah, so track that's in Portland. Yeah, so at the track, you can bet on the race that's occurring right there, um, and that's what probably most people are familiar with. 
but also at a commercial track, you can bet at any number of other races across the country or potentially across the world. Um, and those, those races are shown on a series of television, large screen television sets, and you are able to um, bet on all manner of races across the country or the globe. Um, what, they're, what this bill would, would do, as I understand it, would be to allow the simulcast piece, which is betting on races on other tracks, to happen at a different location than at the commercial track itself. Great, thank you. And can you, um, it's probably a hard political question, but I'm not as familiar with, um, I've heard folks describe um, the Bangor facility and like a bit of separation that exists is something that potentially hurt the actual horse racing that took place there. Um, and, you know, maybe in my lack of knowledge, I'm wading into a political area, but I'm just wondering if you could, um, could comment on that and what consensus is about that separation that's taking place. Well, I think it, it's a complicated and difficult question and certainly political. I think um, the, and I don't think I want to be, uh, it's a difficult question, but I think as originally envisioned when the, when the legislature authorized um, the, the casino that's in Bangor, that it was in conjunction with a commercial track. Um, and that's across the country. A lot of times that's, that's what's happened is casinos have joined with commercial tracks so that both um, operations can be essentially unified and operate together. Um, in Bangor, they ended up moving the casino down onto Main Street. And so it's, I don't know what it, it's a thousand feet or something away. Um, I think there's some sentiment that that may have um, resulted in drawing fewer people to the, the harness racing track. In this case, I think the, op the opposite problem may be the, the real issue. And that is um, you've got first tracks trying to operate in a, in a very rural kind of remote location that's distant from the population. So I think they may, they may be up against the opposite issue than Bangor had. Because you know, in the Bangor circumstance, both entities were squarely in the city of Bangor. Um, so they were in a population center. Um, what's going on with first tracks currently is that they are not in a population center. And so I th hence, I think that that's the um, logic to the proposed amendment. Okay, thank you. I see a question. I'm not sure who had their hand up first. So I'll call on representative, I'm Senator Black, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jennings for being here. And, you know, I might not have this completely right, but um, the, the highest people are trying to uh, and want a another commercial track and at this point in time, the only commercial track available to them is, is Cumlin, which you've already stated is in a rural area. And they really need to get this off and move to a new location. They really need this income to, as we heard in a public hearing, you know, a lot of the support to run the uh, track is uh, from uh, the, you know, betting, you know, uh, simulcast. Am, am I correct in saying that, that they basically need this income to operate and to move forward with the commercial track and get them located together somewhere uh, down the road? Well, so there's two pieces to it, I think. Um, again, I, I can't speak for the track. I'm, I don't know if there's anyone for the track on, on the um, Zoom call, but um, all, I'm, all I would try to do is suggest that yes, there, there is a process underway to build a new track um, somewhere else. And, and I know that's ongoing and I'm very, I'm very hopeful about it. Um, but um, it, in terms of the revenue, I think that right now they have no simulcast and um, at Cumberland and they don't see it as 
as, as I've been told, they don't see it as um, feasible to really justify the investment to, to have a simulcast in, um, in Cumberland. Um, so that, again, that's a substantial portion of the revenue that a commercial track um, generally um, operates on. I don't have, I don't have, you know, I can't tell you exactly what the percentages are, but the, I think, you know, to some degree, though, that's a question for the commercial track itself. Madam Chair? Yes, a follow-up? Uh, well, yeah, kind of. Uh, when I, I see some other hands, so I don't want to cut uh, Mr. Jennings off, but I, I see the bill sponsor is here too. So at, at some point, could we ask to talk to him? Absolutely. Thank you. Representative Kreisak, would you like to speak now before we go into more questions? Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the reason that um, I put this bill forward is I would go to um, harness racing twice a year. They used to have it at Freiburg Fair and they used to have it at Rochester Fair. Um, they no longer have it there. I mean, it's, it's disappearing. And from what I've been told from the industry, a lot of our main harness racing people are traveling to Massachusetts and other states because the purses are bigger. So that's one of the reasons they want to lower the amount of days so that they could have bigger purses and more people and, and have our main harness people not have to go to Massachusetts. So it's tax money for, for uh, Maine by having this um, facility here in Maine. Now, they're just starting with the Cumberland um, racing. And as they've already told you that you're not going to get a lot of people from the cruise ships coming up to Cumberland to uh, bet on the um, races all around the world. But if we, if they have their place in uh, Portland while they're in the process of building the new facility, um, then that's going to open the doors for them and, and help them build the new facility by making some money. Um, so I don't, I don't see the cruise ships um, taking buses and sending them up to Cumberland so that they could bet on horse racing. So I think it, it's a great option to have them do that. Um, I've raised uh, Arabian since 1979. So I know what it was like in the pandemic, not having money come in and still having to feed those horses. It's like having a boat. It's a hole in the water that you fill with money. The horses are an animal that you got to feed every day, no matter whether you're racing or not. So this is a good thing for the industry all around. It's a good thing for Maine because it's going to bring a lot of tax dollars back into Maine um, that are now going to Massachusetts, New Jersey, and wherever else that the harness racing, it, uh, our harness racers are going. Um, and I look at it as you want to go out and play baseball and you only have your brother or your sister. You can't play the whole team. So if you have a harness race with only two horses compared to a harness race that has 10 or 12 or whatever the amount that they're allowed to have in, in the size of the track, it's a lot more interesting and it's going to draw a lot more people. So this bill gives the harness racing industry the freedom to move forward um, in this time, especially coming out of the pandemic. Thank you. Um, and I see others with hands up. I just wanted to quickly ask. So the plan is currently racing in Cumberland and yep. folks want to build a track in Saco, correct? And they want to have a casino in Portland or a temporary casino in Portland. And are they moving that to Saco? There is no casino involved. This, this bill only allows them to um, simulcast races, horse racing. And you can go and bid, bid uh, bet on the races that are in Cumberland, or you can bet in, on horse races around the country or around the world. There's no um, any kind of other gambling like, um, you know, blackjack or, or um, you know, the machines. Um, so it's, it's not a casino, it's a simulcast. So they're going to film um, races as they're happening and you can watch the race, whichever one you want to watch anywhere around the world and bet on that race. Um, but there's no other gambling involved. So it's not a casino. And the reason they're doing that is, is if they put all the money into all the computers and everything else in Cumberland, they're not going to get the people to come up there that's going to make it worthwhile for them to spend the money there. So they want to put it into Portland until they can get the new um, track built. And what kind of size facility is this? Like, what, what are we talking about? 
As far as the simulcast? Yes. Yeah, I don't. I don't gamble, so I I can't imagine what it would be like. Well, it, if it's, I, I, I'd have to have somebody else answer that because I haven't seen any of the plans and I still even don't know where they're going to build the uh, new track. That's still in the works, so that hasn't been released yet. Um, so as far as how big the building will be, I mean, it's, it's not like they're going to put an enormous casino and hotel. They're probably going to rent some space in Portland and, and people will just go in and bet like you do at the fair. So, I mean, the fairs have booths. So you go up and you bet your $2 on a horse and then you go up and sit in the stands and watch it. And that's, that's all this is. All right. Thanks. Um, I see representative Paul in the queue. Thank you, madam chair. Um, I just like to, to maybe elaborate a little more on representative Chrysac uh, comments. Um, I know that, that the fairs, I've been involved with the fairs my whole life, and I know being president of the Farmington Fair, we, we simulcast up there, and it's only for a week. And the reason that we do that is so that the people, say, in Portland, Lewiston, uh, Bangor, wherever, um, California, um, can actually bet on our horse races. And it, it raises a lot more money and helps with the purses for the, for the horsemen. And... I think that the reason that this bill has been put in was because of Scarborough Downs uh, had been sold and with Scarborough Downs being sold that the horsemen didn't have enough horse racing throughout the summer that they could actually continue to, to keep their horses and whatnot. And I know this, this talk, and I'm not sure whether it's Saco or where it is of building a new track. I know there's one, proposed in southern Maine in York County and it's going to be close to the to the turnpike so you know easy access or whatnot um, but until that track is built they needed to have uh, a place where they could race and a venue where they could you know get some income which that's uh, Cumberland Fair graciously said that they could could race at their track for for however long a year or two until this this new track is built um, so that's that's why they're being why they're racing there, but yet being in the in the rural rural part of Maine, they just can't get enough people to come there to bet on the horses. So to, in order to increase the revenue, that's why we're putting in. You know, they have these off track betting places, and maybe to expand upon that a little bit, uh, Representative Neil, on your question about an off track betting venue, what a uh, place like that will do is is they'll rent a, a place in Portland, say, at a at a restaurant, um, you know, a, a back room or something, and a place where someone can go in and they can sit down and, and have something to eat, something to drink, and bet on the horse races. And they'll be up on computer screens. And not only would it be the horse races in Cumberland, but it might be at Sarasota or uh, uh, Plain, Plain, uh, Plain View, View of Plainwood, I believe it is, in, in uh New York, New Jersey, and they can bet on all these different Plain races Ridge. at different Plain Ridge. Thank you, thank you, Representative Underwood. You're right. Uh, I couldn't think of the name, but anyway, they could bet on all these different horse races at the same time, while you know, just as a, a form of entertainment. So, uh, I th this bill is actually just going to get it so that that the horse race, the highest horse racing people, can continue with their sport, and we don't lose that the horses and that industry in the state of Maine while a new track is being built. So at some point I would make a motion, but I, I believe that we need to, to answer some more questions, but I would make a motion uh, when we're ready for that. But thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Paul. And I see um, Representative Underwood stand up. Hi, I'm uh, Representative Underwood. Uh, District 147 in Presque Isle, and every, our, the uh, people who have spoken before have explained it to me, and, and it makes me crystal clear that basically, and it could be, they're going to build another track, and it could be so, and uh, it's in that area, and in addition to the track, they want permission uh, to build a um, simulcast in Portland near the cruise line, wherever the cruise ships come in down there. And they, 
for the purposes of, of increasing their revenue. The money in the, the take, so to speak, is uh, taken out of the bat and uh, a certain percentage, say 75% is returned to the, is returned to the better and 25 is what they call the take, the different parts to the take. And part of that take is the uh, certain percentage that is, I just had it, um, is will go to the state and and certain certain part will go to the track, certain, there's different ent entities that get a piece of that take. And part of, and the, there's a part that they, where they, where these uh, casinos like uh, Hollywood and Bangor or, or first tracks in this instance, uh, they want to be able to uh, classify it as a simulcast versus an off track betting because there are two different takes at each individual entity, at each end, each type of entity, and and um, for the purpose of this bill, I would I'm going to agree with the representative Hall when he was saying um, I'm going to support his whatever he whatever he does, and for the benefit of of the uh, industry, and because part of that industry is harness racing, and part of the harness racing is the main horsemen, the main standard breeders. And th these are all different people type, different classifications of people within the industry. And these people all live in Maine and they all probably want to stay in Maine. Uh, the state of Maine has, it also has um, part of a, um, we didn't, we're not going to race up here at the Northern Maine Fair. But again, this is usually part of these horse races are usually part of these agricultural fairs, be they Windsor, Union, um, Farmington, uh, Prescott, Rustic, the uh, Prescott Fair, uh, Bangor has a fair. There's all kinds of different fairs and agricultural associations associated with this industry, and it all increases the revenue to all these you know, all these individual fairs, and um, it benefits the whole state uh, with passage of this bill. So I uh, I agree with Representative Hall and Senator Black and in supporting this bill and, and uh, I'd even vote, I'd, I'd, I'm, I'd even vote yes to, to pass it. And because it's, it, it could benefit a lot of people, including your district. Thank you. Uh, Madam Thank Chair. you for the advice as to what would benefit my district. Um, I see Senator Black's hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I believe that maybe uh, Michael Chinchette the owner of first, uh, uh, of first Track is in the waiting room. And I'd like to make sure that the conversations we're having here, we're accurately re representing uh, what is being proposed. So it, would it be possible to bring him in at this time or, or at some time? I would be happy to um, welcome him in, yes. That was actually my, my request as well. All right, sounds good. We get two birds with one stone. He's coming in. Welcome, Mr. Chinchat. I invite you to um, introduce yourself to the committee by saying your name and where you live and who you're affiliated with. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Michael Chinchat. I, I live in Cumberland, actually, and I'm, uh, I'm guessing I'm here today on, uh, as I'm the manager of First Tracks Investments LLC, which is the uh, one of two uh, licensed commercial racetracks uh, for harness racing in the state of Maine in 2021. Thank you. And do I see any questions from committee members for Mr. Chinchat? Madam Chair? Yes, Senator Buck. Um, I have a question. Uh, so you've heard our conversation here. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on it and make sure that we are accurately uh, portraying what is going on here and not <laughs> assuming certain things? Certainly, no, thank you, Senator Black. No, and, and certainly, I, uh, you know, I appreciate the committee's conversation. It's this is, um, you know, a time of flux, certainly in the harness racing industry, and as I'm sure Mr. Jennings will tell you, because he's dealing with it every day. Um, but, but essentially, uh, with a little bit of background, um, it, as you know, Senator Black, I believe, mentioned, as did uh, as did Representative Hall, um, when the property of, of Scarborough Downs was sold several years ago, uh, it was. 
uh, you know, determined that harness racing was not part of their ultimate development program. And, and uh, as Mr. Cushing from the Harness Horsemen Association, I think said at the public hearing, um, they had a very good conversation with the new property owners uh, that there was a, you know, there was an expiration date on when harness racing would be available uh, to occur at that property and, and when it would cease. Uh, so kind of since then, um, you know, we've been working closely with the Harness Horsemen's Association, uh, with the, the Breeders Association, uh, as well as, you know, folks at the, uh, the Cumberland Farmers Club, which does own the Cumberland Fairgrounds, uh, because I, I think, and, and certainly, you know, some of the members of the committee who may have more experience in the industry than I do, um, would probably tell you that that's a, it's a really good facility for harness racing. Uh, it has the right barns, it has the right track, uh, it's, you know, it, it presents well, uh, and it's a, it's a great opportunity. What it doesn't have, um, you know, for, for several reasons, um, is, is a great opportunity to introduce harness racing uh, to new fans in terms of a simulcast facility. Uh, you know, the, the kind of geographic distance was, is certainly a part of it. Um, but but the, the reality is it's, it's a, a fairgrounds and it's not built uh, to have, you know, transacting business, you know, many days of the year. Uh, so as we've uh, undertaken our efforts and, and we did have our first races this past Saturday, uh, there's a 415 post time today for anyone who wants to zip down and see it in person. Um, you know, we've looked at it and said, well, we have this authorization to do simulcasting. It doesn't make sense for several reasons to do it at the fairgrounds. Uh, Bangor, had, as, as was noted, had previously received authorization uh, from the legislature to move their simulcast facility uh, away from the track. Uh, obviously, Scarborough Downs, uh, or the operators of Scarborough Downs in the, I believe, the 129th, received authorization to open up an off-track betting facility uh, without going through the normal process uh, for OTB licensure. Um, so we said, well, this is an opportunity to, uh, certainly the, the, the economics are a piece of it, um, but also, and I think Mr. Jennings can probably speak to this since I think in 2017, the commission had it, uh, commissioned, a, com the commission commissioned a uh, marketing report on uh, the industry and, and how we bring new people in. And I think one of the things that was really identified in that process is, um, you know, the, the largest city in the state really has zero connection uh, to this, this industry that is not only, you know, a huge part of Maine's heritage, uh, but also supports, you know, millions upon millions of dollars in tax revenue. And, um, you know, I, I know the economic impact study commissioned, I believe by the, the University of Maine in 2016, uh, determined that, you know, nearly 10,000 acres of land is being preserved in open space uh, to feed horses and pasture and train and so forth, um, and really where everything fits. So certainly, it, you know, the, the idea of Portland was made a lot of sense because, again, there's no exposure there now. Um, you know, I believe, as Miss Terry mentioned at the public hearing, you know, there is a, there are a cadre of people that have a, a deep and an undying passion for this, uh, that are her present patrons, and and I I think they'll continue to do that. Um, but this is an opportunity to to present this sport uh, to to more eyeballs, and um, you know really really incorporate the whole state, or at least the, the the Portland part of the state, into what we're trying to do. And and Senator Black, um, you're right. The, you know, the objective is to to build a new track in Southern Maine. The the final location, uh, Representative O'Neill, has not been finally determined. Um, there's, a, there's a couple different sites it, it could land. Um, some of that is, as probably this committee knows well, um, undergoing, you know, kind of our environmental studies to figure out wetlands and vernal pools and, and what's the appropriate location, the appropriate way to, to build it. Um, so that's kind of where we stand. The, the more immediate need on this, and, and I don't, and what I, one of the things I think that was mentioned or, or suggested is that our willingness to proceed is, is somehow conditioned on passage of this bill. That, I, that is not the case. Um, but like everything, and, and certainly as this committee knows well, certainly with the, the F acronym in the committee is, uh, you know, construction costs have gone up precipitously due to COVID. Materials costs have gone up significantly. Um, so the, the math equation is, is relatively skinny uh, in any scenario. And uh, in an increasing environment, you know, this revenue is, is going to be uh, if it's, you know, certainly if it's passed and, and enacted and, and we receive a, a authorization from the Harness Racing Commission, um, 
would be really important and, and helpful as we look to, to build a, a facility that um, really, I think, in my opinion, that, that people can be proud of. It's not intended to be um, you know, a casino. It, there is no casino tied with this. Uh, it's the opportunity to really create an, an outdoor space that has uh, you know, horse racing as a component of, of entertainment. And I think over the last, you know, certainly the last year, we've all had a, an even greater appreciation for the ability to get outdoors. Um, so this is, uh, this is considered part of that. So I thank you, Senator Black, for letting me explain some of that. And, and again, obviously happy to <coughs> talk through any questions that you may have. All right, thank you. Um, I see a hand still up from Senator Black. Are you all set, Senator Black? All right, I'm gonna to move to um, Representative Schofield. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. Uh, the harness racing industry uh, is important. Could you elaborate on the importance of the, the peripherals of the harness racing industry? I think you sort of touched on it. Talking about veterinary services, uh, tractor uh, uh, supply, uh, agricultural supplies, uh, feed supplies, those sort of peripheral things. Could you, could you expand on what those account for in regards to the harness racing industry? Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, and I think I would, you know, I, I appreciate the question representative and I would certainly, um, you know, direct, uh, direct the committee as well to that 2016 economic impact study completed by the university. It was the University of Southern Maine. I, I just pulled it up, um, but you know, the, as a whole, uh, that study indicated there was you know, $27 million in personal income and, and you know, people's main, main people earning money uh, from the industry. And, and you're right, Rep Schofield, that's, you know, there's, there's the owners of the horses. Uh, and I believe uh, Jason Vaffiatis from the Breeders Association indicated they, you know, a horse owner expects to spend about $10,000 a year to, to keep and maintain and train a horse. Uh, and again, they don't run until they're three years old. So it's a $30,000 investment in Maine uh, to get to the starting line. Um, so it's, you know, the, those dollars add up significantly. And, and again, Rep Schofield, you're absolutely right, is, you know, the, the people who are producing hay uh, and maintaining, you know, open space, uh, you know, provide that, which obviously, you know, in the, in the winter months, that open space is used, you know, for snowmobilers, it's used for uh, hunters and, and other sportsmen. It's used for folks to cross country ski, um, you know, and all the way. And, and again, it is, it is Plain Ridge and it's in Massachusetts as, uh, as some of the competition, um, you know, that goes all the way through, you know, automotive dealers who are selling trucks to move these uh, around, people owning tractors. Uh, it's, the, it's really, you know, a, a core part of, of, you know, the agricultural heritage. And, and again, does have a, a significant multiplier effect uh, in terms of, you know, it, all those affiliated and associated places. You know, the other, I think my opinion, the other piece to that, and, and one of the things we're very excited about is, and, and I know I put it in my testimony and I do have an updated map uh, for the committee that I can send if, if anyone is interested, uh, but the, the video from Cumberland, Maine, um, you know, from my, the town I live in, you know, a relatively small town in the, in the grand scheme of the world, uh, is being broadcast to more than 30 countries in 36 states. Uh, and there's all those people seeing uh, certainly what Maine racing is, uh, but again, thinking longer term, particularly as we bring on a new facility, uh, it's an opportunity to really advertise Maine, um, you know, in terms of quite literally, you know, signage on the backstretch as those cameras are around, but also, uh, you know, build some of that cultural interchange. Obviously, I think as many members of the committee know, uh, you know, Maine has, has seen significant uh, kind of economic integration with other so-called Arctic Circle countries and, and provinces. Uh, and harness racing is, is very, very popular in Scandinavia. Uh, so that's, you know, one of the things in longer term in the vision, you know, we want to put Maine quite literally on the world map on this, particularly for, for folks who might be our, our trading partners, whether it's tourism, whether it's goods and services, um, you know, really have that opportunity to, uh, to, to showcase something as, as part of the main brand. Um, it, it, you know, harness racing is, is certainly, you know, the horse that pulls the sleigh, uh, but, but I think the sleigh can, uh, can go a much longer way. Thank you for, thank you. Those are very good comments. Thank you, appreciate it, helpful. 
Thank you. All right, and I see a hand up from Representative Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it seems to me maybe that one of the only hangups on this uh, whole thing is about the OTB, the off-track betting parlor in Portland. And the question that I would have for Mr. Chinchette is, would your entity be opposed to if we put an amendment on the bill that that OTB would only be licensed until a new track was established in Southern Maine? And when uh, horse racing uh, ended at Cumberland, and you move to your new track, that that uh, OTB would would close down in Portland. Would that be a possibility? Oh, absolutely. That's uh, and and candidly, uh, Representative Hall, that's that's a friendly amendment. Um, that's that is our plan. Um, you know, again, barring barring some wholesale change in the in the entire industry done by this committee or, or a future legislature. Um, you know, the the intent is not to have a a permanent location in Portland. Uh, the intent is to build something. Uh, that people would really, uh, you know, as, as I think you mentioned is, you know, as folks get off the cruise ships or as folks head down to Old Orchard or, or Sanford or wherever, um, that would be a draw in its own right. So that, that's absolutely a friendly amendment. And, and certainly, uh, you know, obviously the other piece to this uh, well, is really twofold. One is, you know, this only exists insofar as we're actively putting on races or actively licensed to put on races at a track. So if we ever tap out on that, our authorization to do this goes away. That's, you know, that is the, the legal licensure requirement. Um, and the other side of it is obviously, as this committee knows well, uh, you know, you, you confirm the members, uh, you know, the Harness Racing Commission is, is the regulatory body. They do have, uh, you know, some significant authority to impose conditions and do, you know, what they believe is, is right in the context of everything else. So, um, the short answer, Rep. Paul, is yes, that's a friendly amendment, and, and the slightly longer answer is yeah, that's that's our plan. Okay. Um, um, so what? I want to communicate that I I do not feel like I'm in a place where I'm um, ready to vote on this, and I think because it affects my area more than anybody else's, I I want to ask questions I don't really want to put other people through. Um, so if I don't know. I'll leave it up to you guys if you want to um, table uh, it. Madam, Thursday, but or Madam I Chair, may I, may I, may I speak, Madam Chair? Absolutely. Yes. Um, this is kind of an emergency clause because if we don't vote on this, uh, the ho harness horse racing people are, you know, they're they're in jeopardy, and. And I don't see where it's going to make a difference in in your area, your district, uh, at this point. So, with that being said, I would like to make a motion that this bill pass with the amendment added to it that the OTB in Portland would be mo closed or moved with with a new track when it's opened up. And I'm not sure if the wording's correct on that, but I'm sure that Karen can help us out on that. But that would be my motion. I'll second that. All right, and I see a second from Representative Underwood. Any commentary on the motion? All right, seeing none, I'm just going to say, Representative Hall, that, um, that the motion, the amendment that you have offered um, should it be built in my town guarantees that the bedding facility would be in my town. And I have just expressed to you that I would like more information. So I'm really surprised. It's not typical in this committee to put off a tabling motion and we don't have a session tomorrow in between, um, what's going on Thursday. So, um, I am upset. I, th I think it's not respectful of a request that I'm making that would potentially affect my community that I would like more information about. But, um, yeah, so I guess I'm going to make a move to table it and to take this back up on Thursday. I second. Thank you. I'm going to ask for a show of hands. I need to count. One, two, three, four. I have six. Out of five, out of how many? I'm sorry, I can't count. I have six. 
One, two, three, four. And how many are present? How many oppose it? Are present. I just can't oh, talk. Oh, sorry. Madam Chair, should we roll call? We could do that to make it easier. <laughs> so this is this is to table sixteen eleven. Yes. LD 1611 to be tabled. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black. No. Senator Russell Black, no. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill. Yes. Representative Maggie O'Neill, yes. Representative Randall Hall. No. Representative Randall Hall, no. Representative Thomas Schofield. No. Representative Thomas Schofield, no. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. No. Representative Joseph Underwood, no. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford. No. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, no. Representative David McCray, absent. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. So that's six to five to table. All right, thank you. Um, do we, Cheryl, do we have anything left on our calendar for today after um, we set aside those two bills? 1565 we still have. And I believe there's a <clears throat> representative Osher asked that the committee reconsider 574. All right. All right. So I'm going to open up the work session for, um, I'm getting the numbers wrong. Will you say the number again, please? 1565. Um, oh, 1565, an act to strengthen Maine's agriculture, food, and forest economy. Um, and Karen, I'll turn it uh, over. Excuse me. Again, please. Sorry, I have to leave in about 15 minutes. So um, I appreciate that you would open up that one so that I can change my vote, but I won't be able to do it if, if it's after 15 minutes from now. Okay, we could do that. Um, our folks all sat with with that. And Representative Osher, could you articulate what you would like to do? Uh, on the food sovereignty bill, I would like to change my vote. So I'm in support of Bill uh, Representative Pluker's amendment. So if you are you are on the prevailing side, which is ought not to pass, you can make that motion. So I make a motion that I change my vote to ought to pass. Madam Chair. But actually, you just, you make a motion to reconsider and okay, then- I make a motion to reconsider. Then, yeah. Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Um, Representative Booker. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I should have followed procedure and you should have gotten a second for the thing. I would be, just as a, for, to have a, a, a conversation on this bill, um, would it be all right with the committee if we did this on Thursday instead of today? Does that work for everybody present? Representative Osher too? Sure, that's fine. I can agree to that. Yeah, it shouldn't take too long, so. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks. All right, so let's go back to Representative Talbot Ross's bill, which is LB 1565, and I'll turn it over to Karen. Thank you, Representative. Um, so section two of the bill um, requires the commissioner of ACF to work with the Department of Economic and Community Development to carry out um, the following duties. Um, so this is kind of um, uh, not exactly the same, but this is uh, very similar to a bill that um, the ACF committee of the 129th work worked on. Um, it was also Representative uh, Talbot Ross's bill, LD 1531, and um, it was voted out of committee. And of course, uh, when the legislature adjourned, 
abruptly, um, it, it died upon adjournment. Um, but this bill is, is, is um, kind of a, a new version of that idea. So uh, section two uh, requires the commissioner of ACF to work with DECD um, to strengthen the state's agricultural food and forest products economy, uh, to expand infrastructure investments in the agricultural food and forest products econ economy, and to collaborate with other state agencies, economic development organizations, and other key institutional partners to establish uh, a technical assistance program. And then it, um, section two also establishes the main agriculture food and forest products investment fund to facilitate these strategic investments in the state's agricultural food and forest products processing and manufacturing industries. <clears throat> and it also establishes the main agriculture food system and forest products infrastructure investment advisory board. There's 13 members, um, the commissioner of ACF or her designee and the commissioner of DECD or his or her designee and 11 members appointed jointly by the two commissioners and they have three year terms. So section three of the bill um, requires the department of ACF to undertake an assessment to identify uh, opportunities for investment in agricultural food and forest products industries to inform the development and structuring of disbursements of the fund that I spoke of earlier and other potential natural resource industry related funds. And then finally, it requires the commissioner of ACF to submit a report relating to that assessment in section three of the bill um, to this committee no later than December 1st, 2021. Uh, having said all that, um, I did see an email from uh, Representative Talbot Ross this morning. I haven't really had a chance to look uh, closely at it, but it looks like she has um, some amendments that she would like the committee to consider. Um, so I don't know if she, I, there she is, um, if she is, if the committee would like to to hear more about those. And I will leave it at that for now. Thank you, Karen. Um, any questions for Karen, Governor Booker? No, thank you. I was hoping to hear from this bill sponsor and uh, Amy Winston from CEI. Absolutely. Um, so first I'll welcome the sponsor, Representative Talbot Ross. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished members of the ACF committee. Um, I've been having, having a little trouble with my internet, so if you can just let me know if for some reason I start to break up, that'd be great. Um, I did want to offer um, a friendly amendment. Um, after listening to um, the public hearing in which I want to thank again, Representative Pluker for doing the heavy lifting and giving my testimony. Um, I have gone back in, I've worked with um, both the lead Senate sponsor, uh, Senator Hickman. I've worked with uh, the commissioner for DACF, uh, Amanda Beal. Um, I did work with um, uh, Dana uh, Duran, um, who had offered an amendment to this committee during his testimony and Amy Winston, who's with us right now from Coastal Enterprises. So both the department and stakeholders um, I've worked on with this amendment. There are four overarching shifts um, in the bill that I'd like to talk about. Um, one is uh, the appointing authorities need to include the um, legislative branch. So in the original bill, the only appointing authority for membership onto this board uh, is done by DACF and DECD. Um, that I'd like uh, to change so that there is appointing authority to the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate. And I can get into what that um, specific membership will look like. The other overarching shift is that we, while we say in the bill, the original bill, that the appointments to the board need to have some uh, respect for racial diversity in the state, there really is no specific mechanism to ensure that that would happen. Uh, if you look at the membership categories, 
there's very few um, members of the underserved racial uh, communities in the state who would actually be able to fill any of these roles. So it's kind of a window dressing, if you would. Um, so one of the changes that I'm making in this amendment is to be very specific that we have to include members of our um, racial uh, diverse communities here in the state. The third uh, shift is that the membership on the board in the original bill um, allowed one member to serve three consecutive terms of three years, which could mean that uh, an individual could almost serve 10 years on this board without any change in membership. Um, that was an oversight. So I'd like to change the limitation to two consecutive terms of three years per term so that an individual could serve six years on this board uh, conceivably. And then the fourth change is to expand the membership to move it from um, a total of 15 members um, instead of the current um, construction, which is 13 members, making the two commissioners of DACF and DECD ex officio members of the board and not um, voting members of it, which seems to uh, uh, would give a, a little too much weight out of um, 15 members. If we added them as voting members, it would be a total of 17 and that would allow for um, DACF and DECD um, to have almost half of its membership reporting um, being influenced by, by their departments. So. Those are the changes. I can go through them again for you. Um, I have suggested a way uh, to break up the membership. It would be five members appointed by DACF and DECD jointly, five members appointed by the Speaker of the House, and five members appointed by the President of the Senate uh, for a total of 15 members. And again, DACF and DECD commissioners would be ex officio. So those are the changes. I, um, I do have them in writing um, and can send this, this uh, updated version to your analyst. Um, I know it's a lot to keep track of. Great, that'd be very helpful. Thanks for going over it, Representative Talbot Ross. Um, Absolutely. And I see someone else, um, or do I see any questions for Representative Talbot Ross? I have one actually. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so I did receive the email 841 AM this morning. Is that the most recent version it, of your amendment? It seems- No, it is, my apologies. No, it is not because I did hear from Mr. Duran and uh, he wanted a shift in the appointing authority for uh, the um, statewide group representing the logging and trucking industry. So I shifted that um, according to, um, you know, what he had suggested. So I can send the updated version to you now. I, I did want to be as uh, responsible to Mr. Duran's, um, uh, you know, position that uh, he made during his testimony. We lost you just a little bit, or maybe my internet's. Yeah, I reached out to him. Representative Color also coming in and out. All right, I might be. Representative Color Ross. I think it's on all of us. Okay, I'm going to press mute just to, because I think we can. Um, I know that Ms. Winston is here and had done a lot of work on this. So Ms. Winston, could you please introduce yourself and, um, and share with the committee um, the background work that's gone into this? Sure. Um, my name is Amy Winston and I work on state policy for Coastal Enterprises, CEI. And I have worked closely um, with the representative and um, with the department and other stakeholders um, on this bill um, since its inception um, during the 129th. Great. And um, yeah. Is there anything you'd like to share about, about process or? 
Does anybody, uh, if not, we can see if folks have particular questions. Um, as far as the process moving forward to establish the board, um, if the bill is to pass or the- The process that you've gone through and building it, um, why it would be helpful. Just you, you were here to share something. So I was wondering what that was. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, the conversation has been that um, codifying um, the investment needs and the gaps in um, agriculture and value added food um, products um, has, is, has been a real necessity for that, for the food system sector to have a roadmap by which to benchmark progress and have an investment fund um, somewhat like, you know, the main venture fund. And in our testimony, we noted that there was inspiration both from Vermont's Working Lands Enterprise Fund and, um, fund and initiative, and also from Massachusetts um, from the Food uh, Innovation Trust Fund there. And the way that they engage public-private partnerships um, to um, leverage um, public funds and stimulate private investment um, in value-added food. And in Vermont, it's beyond the food system. It's really the food and forestry. And they don't have aquaculture. Um, but it would be, um, we felt like, and the stakeholders we worked with um, felt like it was value-added food system would be the tip of the iceberg to expand out to have a working lands um, program in Maine. And it really aligns well with our economic development strategy, our economic recovery planning, and um, the focus on, you know, re-adapting re and innovating, um, you know, quote-unquote heritage-based um, pursuits and industries. So, um, yeah, it's been a really great process of um, working with peer organizations and industry stakeholders and offering our lessons learned from the area of financing and investing value-added um, businesses. Um, we included some testimonies from the businesses that we've worked with um, in our tastemaker program and that we've invested in through our catalyst fund um, in our in our testimony on the bill. And so I would definitely encourage, and there's a lot of background on the history of the bill and the theory behind the program and the impacts that have been uh, made in our neighboring states um, and, and the opportunity to sort of play a bigger role in supply chain um, uh, development and integrity in the Northeast. Um, I don't wanna go on um, and on because I will if you're not going to stop me. Um, so I'm happy to, to offer some more or just to um, listen to the rest of the session. So, um, I, I do think that the representative's proposals around um, the advisory board make sense. I think the one thing I would add is that um, there were two slots for financing it, financial institutions, one for value added um, food products and one for, or I guess, uh, experience and expertise in agricultural products and in forestry products. And I think there was a um, consideration of how to prevent those from being dominated by either or industry um, in, in order to have some balance there. Um, but also I think a key is to make sure that there's um, experience with rural economic development because the, the intended impact is, is um, there's, as the representative point, has pointed out, there's a lot of equity objectives in, in the bill and that includes rural economic development for rural communities. And so I think that um, experience with rural economic development and mission-driven investing is something that would be important to um, maybe clarify in the language around, um, around those. And I'm sorry to take up so much of your time. I really appreciate you inviting me to speak. Thanks so much for being here and sharing your expertise. Um, all right, so does anybody have any more questions? Do you, does anybody want to hear from the department? I hear, I see uh, Senator Bob. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I can't, you know, I was ready to support this bill before the amendment, but now with the amendment, it's just the committee is too large and too political for me to support. So I, I won't be supporting this. I could have supported the original bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Can, um, of the four things, can we go back to, I'm trying to remember what the four things were. It, was there some sticking point in particular? Also, Representative, I can't raise my hand for some reason. 
uh, probably oh, sorry. Co -host. No, no problem. But at some point, can we hear from Nancy McGrady from the department as all? Well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, so, Senator, was there something in particular? Oh, Senator Black. Or, or oh, would I it be helpful to go over the yeah. half yeah. I, I have a hard time hearing you. You, you, don't, you don't come in clear. But, oh, I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, you're difficult to hear. Um, oh, can you hear me better now? Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Um, sorry, no, I'm probably uh, too far back. Okay. So, I just was curious what it was. Oh, I, I, the makeup of the board now, I, I can't support the makeup of the board being uh, the way it is right now. Uh, so that's that's my sticking point right now. Thank you. Okay. I'm just wondering if there's a particular item that we could point to to, to talk about um, changing to make it work because I'd love to vote on this together. Um, I see, um, um, Dr. McBrady, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nancy McBrady. I'm the Bureau Director of the Bureau of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Resources. Um, I would I would love to, to comment on this, but um, I believe that Commissioner Beal is actually in the waiting room, and I will defer to her because I know that she's been actually speaking with Representative Talbot Ross, um, so I'll defer to her. Well, that's great. All right, let's welcome in Commissioner Beal, please. Welcome, Commissioner. Hello. Good afternoon. Could you hear us or were you stuck in the black hole? Um, if you asked a question, I might not have heard it. I heard that I was being brought over. Okay. So I'll just, just welcome you to introduce yourself for anybody listening that might not know and um, just to comment on the background work that's gone into it. Sure. Yes, I'm Amanda Beal and I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. And um, first, I want to say thank you to uh, Representative Talbot Ross for her work on this bill. Um, we very much appreciate her interest as well as CEI's interest in supporting our agriculture and forestry sectors. And, um, and so there's, there's a lot here that we um, have been very happy to, to see put into this bill. Um, and we're also, of course, very excited about the opportunity to work collaboratively with the Department of um, Community and Economic Development. We feel like that's very positive as well. And, um, and the, just to speak to some of the uh, amended aspects of it, um, we definitely, uh, we, we think the, the representative's comments around the term limits make sense. Um, we, uh, I guess I will say about the, the makeup and the appointment of, uh, of the structure of the um, actual advisory board that, that was definitely a late breaking sort of change. And we had a conversation late last night. Um, I, I understand where the representative is coming from. Um, I think for us, it's really hard to choose uh, if we were only given a certain number of appointments, it's it's just difficult for us to think of a perfect scenario, um, considering all of the different roles on the advisory board are important um, to us uh, as, as we represent stakeholders in agriculture and forestry. Um, with that said, uh, I, I don't know that I've seen the most recent version. I think maybe there was a change, it sounds like, um, since the last version I saw. So. Um, I can't speak to exactly how those positions are allocated at the moment, but I am interested in hearing feedback uh, from folks who feel strongly one way or another about uh, whether certain seats should be appointed by jointly by DACF and DECD's commissioners um, versus uh, the, the House Speaker of the House and the Senate President. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, so when we go back to the changes. Can you go through the changes each by each to, to say, I'm just trying to follow what worked or what didn't. Just with reference like this or that, I just don't know what you're referring to. Sorry, are, is that a question for me? It is, yeah, because we had had some four specific amendments if we could list them. And I think if I'm remembering correctly and I'll have Karen correct me, one was, 
add loggers and truckers interests brought by um, Mr. Duran. One was add a um, was add um, a racial equity component. One was um, something about I can't remember all four. Karen, could you list all four? I think it was the term limits. The term limits. Yeah. And so, what what change would you recommend? Oh, so I was, I, I spoke to the term limits and said that we felt that that made sense. Um, I didn't speak to the adding the loggers and truckers uh, seat. I think that makes great sense. Um, and the adding uh, racial equity seats, I think that makes great sense as well. And then the last part I was just speaking to was the, the makeup of the um, actual committee and who would be responsible for the appointments. Um, that was what I was, I was. Discussing. Okay, so that was one of the amendments was who, who appoints. Okay, thank you. All right, do, you see, do I see any other questions for the commissioner? Seeing none, um, I want to um, invite re, um, Representative Talbot Ross to come back up just because she got cut off. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I hope I don't freeze again, but if I do, just tell me and I'll stop talking. Um, I really, uh, this is a very strong bill. Um, it's taken two years for us to get to this place working with uh, DACF um, and stakeholders. It's, it's been a long time coming and it's a really strong bill uh, that I'm very proud to um, bring forward. I would hate to lose support because of adding membership to the committee. So um, I um, would love to do a deeper dive into what Senator Black particularly has an issue with in terms of the membership, because I don't want to lose his support uh, and the support of the committee. It's very important uh, to all of us that we have uh, that support. Um, so the membership of the committee, uh, um, you know, we added the, uh, the loggers and trucking based on the testimony from Mr. Duran. And, uh, you know, I really think that, that that was an important bill, always had uh, a, um, uh, a call uh, to consider the racial equity in this state, given the fact that um, we have uh, folks who are engaged in, in farming and forestry um, that would never get um, appointed to this board, um, we felt it was really necessary to name the tribes uh, who are involved in uh, thinking uh, about forestry and, f and forest products. We thought it was important to name that there are Black farmers in this state that may never get a position on this board unless we are explicit about it. Um, and so those were the additions, the loggers and truckers naming a tribal rep um, from the Wabanaki nations, and then you know being explicit and naming the fact that we've got farmers in this state, you know, for 200 years that have never been able to reach the levels of participation in the state. Uh, and when you establish a fund of this nature and you think about investment, it's a critical voice that could very well be missing if we are not explicit. But again, um, and I'm not really um, married to um, as um, the who appoints whom. I just think that it needs the appointing authority needs to go beyond the executive department um, to give the legislature a chance to appoint some of these positions. But again, I'm open to whatever gets the most support from this committee. I don't want to lose your support. I don't want to lose this bill. It's too important. And so I'm open to whatever suggestions the committee may have uh, for uh, any further um, kind of re totally open to that. This is too important to lose. So thank you. Thank you, Representative. I see a hand from Senator Black. Thank you. And, and uh, I guess one question I would have to make sure that I'm clear uh, on my uh, recall of the original bill, uh, at some point I'd like to have Karen or somebody uh, list the membership of it, but I have no um, problem making sure that 
we have racial uh, equality on the board and that the loggers and uh, truckers, you know, I think they should be represented too. My concern was the political appointments of five uh, from the Speaker of the House and five from the pres Senate President. I think that we need to, uh, we need to um, keep it uh, more within the departments, you know, allowing them as original. I, I, and maybe I need, need clarification on the original uh, bill. So maybe if Karen could uh, give me the makeup of the board from the original bill, but I was comfortable, more comfortable with that than I am th this new amendment. Um, Madam Chair, would you that? Yeah, so it's uh, from what I'm hearing from Senator Black is there may be discomfort about uh, the appointments by the Speaker of the House and the Senate President. The bill as originally drafted um, provides that uh, all the appointments are made jointly um, um, by the Commissioner of ACF and the Commissioner of Economic and Community Development. And there are uh, 13 members. So it's hard um, to kind of see what the changes are uh, without, uh, you know, a side by side here. But uh, so, of, so two of the members, one is the commissioner of ACF or the commissioner's designee, um, and then the commissioner of uh, DECD or the commissioner's designee. And then the remaining 11 members are appo appointed jointly by those two commissioners. So one member of a statewide industry group representing conventional non-dairy farming. Um, it looks like that is uh, retained in uh, the amendment. One member of a statewide industry group representing organic non-dairy farming. That looks like it's the same. Um, a financial institution so let's see, one member of a statewide industry, uh, non-dairy, one member of a statewide industry group representing dairy producers. Um, that looks like it's now an appointment of the uh, Senate president. So that's the only change there. Uh, one member, the, the original bill, provides one member of a statewide industry group representing the forest products industry. Okay, I'm following her amendment now. That would be made by the Speaker of the House, the appointment under her uh, amendment. Two members from relevant financial institutions with experience in agricultural and forest products industries. Um, again, so one member would be jointly uh, appointed by the commissioners and then the other member would be appointed by the speaker of the house. Um, so the, the joint appointment by the commissioners would be financial inst institution with experience in forest products industry specifically. And then the speaker of the house would be financial inst institution with experience in agricultural products industry. I don't know if you're following me at all here. Um, if you want me to keep going. Uh, paragraph F in the original bill, one manufacturer of forest products. Looks like that appointment in the amendment would be made by the Senate president. And then um, one manufacturer of value added agricultural products or representative of the value added agricultural products industry. Um, that remains the same and H2 members representing the supply chain and processing, manufacturing or distribution. So again, it looks like that was just split up one appointment. The change in the amendment is that one appointment would be made by the speaker and the other by the Senate president. And uh, paragraph I, one member actively engaged in providing marketing assistance, market development or business and financial planning. And it looks like that appointment is made by the speaker in the amendment. And then um, the new would be uh, made jointly by the commissioners, the statewide group, uh, someone representing a statewide group of the logging and trucking industry. 
And another new would be an appointment by the Senate president, federally recognized tribal member. And uh, another new made by the Speaker of the House would be historically underserved racial population and non-dairy farming. And finally, uh, new would be appointment by the Senate president of a historically underserved racial population in non-dairy farming. That's it. And then uh, I guess, you know, the changes, you were just asking about the changes in the composition of the, the membership. Exactly, yeah, thanks Karen. I realized I muted myself. Um, <laughs> Representative Pluker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Black, would you be able to support it if we just return to the original language of having the two commissioners appointing the members of the group? Yes, I would, and, and especially if there was, you know, uh, a um, reference in there, amendment in there to, uh, uh, you know, for racial e e equity and and allowing somehow the 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 logger trucker um, phrase that uh, represented uh, that uh, Dana Dorian had spoke about, uh, but I could support the original language but I can't support the, uh, the amendment with the increase in the larger uh, board and having the appointments made by the speaker and the Senate president. So we could, you would be all right with the, the, with the larger board if it were appointed by the commissioners? Yes, I could. Yes, I okay. could. By, by the two commissioners. I could, if the two commissioners uh, appointed the board, I, I could support it. Okay. So that would be accepting three of those four elements, Karen? Right. All right. Item one would be struck. Okay. Anybody want to make that motion? I move uh, well, uh, LD 1565 ought to pass as amended with the amendment proposed by uh, Representative Talbot Ross, except for the appointing authority instead of it going to the legislature being the two commissioners of DACF and DECD. Okay. And do I see a second? All right, a second from Representative Landry. All right, any comment or discussion before the vote? All right, seeing none. Um, Cheryl, would you please call the roll? Yes, LD 1565 ought to pass as amended. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. yes. Represent uh, Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Senator Chloe Maxman, absent. Representative Maggie, Maggie O'Neill. Yes. We didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I was laughing. Yes. <laughs> so, well, Representative, Maggie Maggie Maggie. Representative Maggie O'Neill. <laughs> yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. Absent. Representative Joseph Underwood. No. Representative Joseph Underwood, no. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford. Yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, yes. Representative David McRae. Yes. <laughs> Representative David McRae, yes. Representative Susan Bernard. Yes. Representative Susan Bernard, yes. Representative Ten. Underwood, uh, in your minority report, is ought not to pass? Is ought not to pass. It's not needed. Okay. 10 yes, 1 ought not to pass, 2 absent. All right. Um, thank you, Cheryl. And I think, I do, is that a lingering hand, Representative Black? Left over. 
Um, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No worries. Just want to make sure I caught you. All right. So it looks like we've gone over everything we need to go through today. Karen, is there any language review? Thank you. Uh, no. And so the schedule on Thursday, we start off with a public hearing on LD 1690. Um, the idea is the committee might go right into work session on that bill. And then at 9.45, we'll have a discussion on the Wild Blueberry Commission because um, the Government Oversight Committee is meeting the next day and wants our feedback. So um, we'll discuss that. And then, um, then we'll follow that. I'll probably ask Cheryl just to put an arbitrary time of 10 a.m., but that's certainly not any indication of the actual time. <laughs> um, so we have... Uh, all the tabled bills. Um, well, we didn't take up 471 and 1075, and the committee tabled 808, 1594, 1611, and there may be a reconsideration of 574. So that's what I have on my to-do list. One other right. thing is just for everybody on the committee be aware that uh, um, there's like a 99% chance that we'll meet the following Tuesday. There's going to be language review and there's no telling if everything that we've tabled can get untabled and taken care of on Thursday, but so plan on meeting Tuesday. We'll have to, I guess, ask for, for permission, Karen. Or All right, sounds I'm good. Sure. Do I see a motion to adjourn? Yeah. All right, moved and seconded. Move. All right. Second. Guys, take care. Bye bye. See you guys. See, did this work out all right?